Good evening, everyone. And that's the, the issue with going live on these things is you're going to end up having some kind of technical issues here and there. So good evening, everyone. It looks like uh, we've got about six people out there in the lobby at the moment um, watching this broadcast. So uh, we've got about we will give this a few more minutes. I'll go ahead and ramble on just for a couple of minutes to see how many more people are going to join uh, and see see what kind of attendance we're going to have, and then we'll just get started into the content. Um, by way <clears throat> by way of kind of talking through some of the, the things that's going to be going on tonight, um, I, I do have a PowerPoint that I'm going to be talking through, but the PowerPoint is really more of an outline. This is going to be truly, truly kind of a, uh, a live. Uh, I wanted to do as much demonstration as possible. I wanted to do more, uh, more kind of educational and talking through, make it more organic, hopefully getting some backwards and forwards comments and questions from the audience out there, from those of you out there on YouTube, uh, than just kind of bullet pointing you to death in a PowerPoint, because to be quite frank, I don't think that's going to help you a lot. Um, just so you know, you are, I am doing a live broadcast uh, using a software, uh, and that software puts me ahead of you by a few seconds. Um, that few seconds means that sometimes you're going to comment and I may or may not see it immediately. The fact that I'm sitting here um, doing my own um, production studio, so to speak, since I'm here, you know, doing the stay at home social distancing thing. Uh, and the fact that I'm still trying to, to teach and do content and uh, monitor the, the production studio, monitor your comments and questions and try to respond to those in a timely fashion. The fact that I'm trying to do all of that, Please bear with me. You know, if, if it ends up taking a few extra minutes uh, for me to get back to you, just know that I will and I am and will be checking the questions all throughout this broadcast. Um, so that said, if I don't catch your question live and talk through it in this class, although I should. But if I don't, then rest assured that if you leave a comment below. Or if you leave a comment here in this chat where we're, we're talking right now or whichever side it's on. Um, then I will do my best to get back to you either privately or inside of this training course that, that we're we're all in right now. So it looks like we got about three people watching at the moment. Um, that's pretty low. I was kind of hoping to have a few more. So I'm going to kind of ramble on for a couple of more minutes uh, till probably about five minutes after. And then I'm going to really start diving into the to the um, content. So by way of an introduction, uh, I will before I'll give a full blown introduction once I pull up the first PowerPoint slide or two. But just wanted to let everybody know that you are at the right channel. This is going to be uh, the technology based open source intelligence gathering live webinar. I am going to be devoting I scheduled two hours from seven to nine p.m. Um, if it takes that long, if it takes longer, if it takes less, if it takes more, whatever the case may be, I'm here for you all tonight. And uh, hopefully I can share some information that will help those of you in the audience to uh, to uh, learn something that will help you to be better protectors. Um, again, my name is Toby. And I am the owner of Minor Ridge Armory. Uh, I'll jump into the PowerPoint here in just a second. But before I do, I want to give a couple of shout outs and thank yous to a few people real quick. Um, now, before I say these shout outs and these thank yous, I want to make it abundantly clear that I'm not paid by these people. They're not, you know, they don't know I'm getting ready to give these shout outs and these thank yous. You know, I'm in no way affiliated necessarily with a lot of these these companies. Uh, I do not speak for these companies. I am not representatives of these companies. I, I'm, I, I didn't even stay at a Howard Johnson last night. OK, so I can't even fake like I'm part of these companies. But I want to give a couple of shout outs because I, I, I appreciate the fact that these companies let me use their platform both for knowledge ingestion for me to be able to learn uh, and for community um, uh, synergy. I hate to use a corporate slang, but corporate or, uh, but, you know, uh, community of synergy uh, to be able to to use their Facebook groups to post up this live broadcast that you're going to be this webinar you're going to be watching tonight. And the first among those is I want to give a shout out and a thank you to Yusuf Badu at EmergenceDisrupt.com. Yusuf Badu is a, uh, a instructor who teaches situational awareness training. He originally spent over 10 years uh, teaching the uh, Marines Combat Hunter program. Uh, and then when he got out of the Marines, they had their pound of flesh from him and were done with him. He adapted a civilian version of that situational awareness training called situational awareness for employees. Now, I am a in certified instructor for that situational awareness for employees. Uh, that's a civilian based situational awareness training. 
but that's not, I'm not necessarily affiliated with his, his Facebook groups or anything like that. As an admin, I posted up in, in his Facebook group for the instructors, the certified instructors, because I wanted to see if there's any protectors out there in that group that would be able to benefit from this information. And he didn't take it down. He allowed me to leave that up there. And so then those of you who may be joining from the, uh, of the situational awareness for employees, instructors, thank you. And thank you to Yusuf Badu for letting me post that up there. Uh, another admin on his web page is uh, Mike Walker with Brightlink Consulting. Uh, he is an admin over uh, on the uh, Situational Awareness Instructor uh, Facebook page, Facebook group. He's an amazing guy when it comes to marketing and learning how to, to do sales and uh, to increase your business, grow your business, and teaching you things that you need to succeed in the business world, particularly today uh, and, and on online. Um, I think his skills for profit or skills to profit program is is just spot on. It's really amazing. Um, another couple of people I want to say a real quick thank you to is uh, <clears throat> Byron Rogers at ByronRogersMotivation.com. Again, another admin, another uh, I'm not affiliated with Byron, although I have actually purchased his Protector Symposium uh, uh replay uh amazing material and i suggest for any of you out there who um who have not uh who who could benefit from the information of ed calderon mike panone you know byron rogers uh as solutions a bunch of the guest speakers that were out there yusuf badu um, amazing content well worth the price he charges for it but the reason i want to thank him is not because of that and not to do a sales pitch but is the fact that again he has an a executive protection lifestyle facebook group uh that he keeps locked down to only protectors and only executive protection or high threat protection individuals close protection teams uh, and he allowed me to post up this webinar on his on his page and i truly appreciate that byron thank you uh, i don't know if you'll ever see this or not but I appreciate it. And last but not least, I'd like to thank Aaron Malden. Uh, Aaron Malden is a training manager for um, AS Solutions. Uh, he also is the founder of Zert Nation or, or uh, Zert out in Las Vegas, um, Nevada. Uh, he is an amazing trainer. I've taken tons of his courses. I've taken CQB training from him, two-man tactics, vehicle tactics, um, took a almost week-long uh, high threat protection, uh, close protection, executive protection class from him up in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, maybe more like four days. Um, uh, amazing trainer, amazing, amazing trainer, amazing content. Everything he puts out is is worth its weight in gold. Um, he's, he's done some amazing work in the close protection and executive protection industry, helping to get everybody up to speed to where they're supposed to be. So special thank you to him, uh, for starters, for it, for being so generous, uh, him and Byron both, with being so generous and so uh, forthcoming with their knowledge for free. I mean, uh, Byron has a weekly podcast that he puts out that has amazing content as far as teaching protectors and uh, um, and the rest of us, you know, how to be better protectors and how to just be better at your skill. But the, the reason I wanted to thank Aaron is because, again, he is another admin on the um, Executive Protection Lifestyle Facebook page. And he, again, allowed me to post up this, this craziness on their page without kicking me off. So, you know, thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Byron. Thank you, Yusuf. And uh, thank you, Mike, all for allowing me to post up in your groups. So it looks like we're up to about six people or so. So we're go I'm going to go ahead and start rolling into the PowerPoint seeing how bad I can bore you guys, hopefully educate you just a little bit. Hopefully you'll learn one or two things. Now, those of you, those seven of you who are out there, seven or eight, um, I don't care if there's one or if there's 100, I'm still going to talk my, my way through this content, you know, because again, I'm here for you. And again, to circle back, I, you are a few seconds behind me if you're watching out in YouTube live. Um, and so the comments that I see from you will be a few seconds behind. And again, I will try to respond to them as quickly as I can. Um, if you're watching in replay, Thank you so much. Uh, if you if you have a question that you can't post up over in the uh, in the comments, post them below, and I'll try to get back to you when I can. While we're at it, you know that little like, subscribe, ring the bell thing below below here on this YouTube page would be great if I could get a little love there, and if you guys could follow my content if you find value in it. Um, also, you know, Mining Ridge Armory on Facebook would be great. Okay, so. Let me set up my PowerPoint here real quick so that I can see all of the screens and all the content. And then I will share it for you. Share it with everybody. Now, again, as I mentioned already, and I will mention again for those of you who are just joining us, uh, this is going to be not a 
bullet point, uh, a PowerPoint of death. This isn't going to be like that. I, I do have some placeholder slides, but that is literally what they are is placeholder slides so that I can remember some of the key high level points that I want to talk through tonight. Uh, this is going to be more of an organic, actual in the weeds, in the dirt. Uh, demonstration style PowerPoint. So this is going to be very organic, very natural. I don't have a script that I'm reading off of. You know, I'm going completely off the rails on this one uh, to be able to to give you as as useful information as possible. So we'll jump right into it. With the technology based open source intelligence gathering advanced work and non-permissive environment options. So now what I mean by that slide is that technology-based could mean cell phones, iPads, you know, um, computers, Linux, Mac OS X, Windows, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it could mean, you know, closed circuit cameras. It could mean, you know, uh, GPS tracking devices on the bottom of your vehicle. It could mean this, it could mean that. So technology is just a general word that I'm using to describe the fact that we're going to touch on a lot of different subjects, a lot of technology based material tonight uh, across a lot of different realms. Now, open source intelligence gathering, we'll talk about exactly what that is here in just a few minutes uh, and, and what advanced work and non-permissive environment options are. Okay. So. Before we get into that, again, technical issues there as I jump through slides a little too fast for myself. I want to introduce you to who to who I am and why it matters as to whether, you know, whether you should listen to me or not. You know, do I even know what I'm talking about or not? Well, probably not, but I'm gonna go ahead and fake it until I make it, and that's the main thing. So again, my name is Toby Gross. I'm the owner of a small um, small firearms instruction and security consultation uh, business named Mining Ridge Armory. By day, I do project management in the information security realm, in the IT realm of a Fortune 40 company, uh, trying to hold down, you know, tr trying to pay the bills, so to speak, um, uh, with a big focus on uh, identity and access management is kind of my um, key area of focus at the moment. But again, through the years I have, you know, for, for that Fortune 40 company, I have managed many multi-million dollar projects uh, ranging from hardware deployments to software deployments, um, you know, audio, audio visual projects, you know, multi-million dollar AV projects, um, and so on and so on, you know, and of course, information information technology projects at large, as well as information security projects. So I have a lot of project management, a lot of actual you know, screw turning in the weeds, uh, getting dirty experience in the computer realm. Um, I like to tell everybody, you know, from an information security perspective, you know, and this is it's a joke, but it's not a joke. It's funny because it's true. You know? um, I've actually been doing uh, IT in one form or another for over 30 years now, well over 30 years. Um, I started when I was 14 years old. Uh, as funny as that may sound in high school with basic computer programming and typing class. I took, <laughs> I took basic computer programming and typing to meet girls. It was kind of frowned on to be on the wrestling team and to, to take a home ec class. So I figured, Hey, you know, I can meet girls over here. Well, you know, I didn't know that, you know, ner nerds don't do that. I mean, it, nerds, it's, it's not, it wasn't a thing back then. You were, you were, you know, we've all seen the movie Revenge of the Nerds. It wasn't a thing back then. Typing, on the other hand, though, there was a lot of females in that class. Little did I know that it was going to, to stick and that, that over 30 years later, that would be some of the most important education I had actually received in my past, shockingly. Um, through the years, I started taking around 2008 or so, I started taking uh, the computer industry, you know, uh, very seriously. I had, had previously done, you know, graphics designs, computer, you know, building, repair, malware, remediation, et cetera, et cetera. But I started actually going back to school and striving to receive certifications and official training. So I started my, on the path, just like everybody else, in the weeds as a grunt, you know, um, installing RAM, fixing computers, taking viruses off, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I did that for quite a while. And then uh, realized that if I was ever going to go up in the world uh, where I was at, uh, or if I was ever going to go anywhere to the left or to the right, I needed to start focusing on process and project management. So I started doing process, uh, started taking process training and project training and received certifications in, uh, you know, uh, network security, uh, security, uh, project management, uh, ITIL foundations, et cetera, et cetera. All IT related project and process management. Uh, also, as from a physical security perspective, so not only information security and IT, but physical security, you know, obviously I'm just like everybody else out in the country, you know, I've been shooting since I came out of the womb, 
um, but around 2000 and concealed carrying for you know a ton of time and, and so on. But I started taking it really seriously again around the 2010 year time frame, so about 10 years ago, uh, and decided I wanted to be a concealed carry instructor in the state that I live in. And so I started, uh, so it, it became a, another passion for me or an obsession for me. I went in my state, you have to be an NRA pistol instructor to be and then go take the, the Department of Justice, North, uh, Department of Justice training to be uh, the laws and use of deadly force and to be an instructor for concealed carry. Uh, after that, it just it became it became an addiction for me. Uh, I've I've now I am now an NRA training counselor, which means that I actually train the trainers in almost every discipline that NRA has, except for like the, the reloading and, and muzzle loading and things like that. Um, I've also taken, uh, you know, advanced training classes throughout the year in both legal and tactics. So there is a difference between tactics and technique. So the NRA training classes teach you the technique of how to properly shoot a rifle or a shotgun or so on. But to take the, as I mentioned with it, the Aaron Malden classes to take CQB training, vehicle tactics, you know, team defense, et cetera, et cetera. Those types of things are more around tactics as opposed to techniques. So I've committed to taking at least two training courses every single year to keep myself uh, ever growing in knowledge and ever expanding. In addition to that, I've spent, you know, countless thousands of hours of reading books, watching videos, you know, taking other training, um, working with uh, law enforcement, and military locally, and, and just picking up skills and, and uh, tactics and technique, both from anybody that will share it with me. Um, so this year, again, I'll go to at least two training courses this year, uh, and I'll teach as many as I possibly can. As a side note, I don't just focus on the hard skills. I consider anything to do with firearms to be a hard skill. I also spend a considerable amount of time on soft skills. So as I mentioned earlier, the situational awareness, I'm a certified instructor for them. Uh, and I spend a great deal of time studying into a bunch of the uh, Joe Navarro materials and body, uh, body language materials to try to be able to identify threats uh, based on biometrics, kinesics, uh, proxemics, iconography, and so on and so forth before that those events occur to try to, to you know, do that. Uh, I also take a lot of um, mindset and legal training, such as the Masada Ayub training, uh, as well as, uh, you know, volunteering a lot of time, like with the North Carolina Wildlife Commission being a hunter education instructor, uh, in a uh, instructor uh, and uh, RSO for uh, Boy Scouts of America and so on and so forth. So that's pretty much kind of who I am and what I know about computers and what I know about uh, physical security. So uh, physical security, as you can imagine, it kind of bleeds over. So, I mean, anytime you're talking about doing physical security for a site, and you're talking about technology, well, the two obviously go hand in hand. If you're going to be talking about physical security for a church or something like that, uh, a religious organization, clearly that those two are going to go hand in hand. You're going to have a physical security presence uh, and you're also going to have the technology behind the scenes to make sure that it all works. Now, by way of a disclaimer, I want to say up ahead of time, while I have had official, actual, legit, structured training in things like forensic data recovery, um, you know, um, forensic scrubbing of, of a computer for, for information that's missing, uh, being able to attach to, you know, computers and technology without leaving a trace into or out of, um, you know, I have had formalized training in, uh, open source intelligence gathering in some forms of, um, uh, penetration testing, uh, vulnerability research. I have had formalized training in a lot of different areas from an IT perspective, but what I have not had is official legal training from a law enforcement or military perspective on chain of custody, evidence retention, evidence, you know, evidence, um, evidence, uh, care, you know, so that it, you, when you get to court, everything looks good. So everything I'm going to be talking about tonight and teaching you tonight comes from a very real world application based scenario. I do have training and I understand like if, if a law enforcement officer tells me, hey, you know, I, I can't do this because if I did when it went to court, it would get kicked out. I get it. I, I completely understand what he's saying. So, for example, if, uh, to give you an example, if you handed me a computer from Joe Crackhead that you kicked out of your house. Um, I, if you just if you handed me a computer from Joe Crack house that you're you know, you're a landlord and Joe 
Joe Crackhead left the computer and you said, hey, I want to pull his hard drive and I want to see, I think he was doing, you know, sex trafficking or drug trafficking. I want you to pull that evidence so I can give it to the police. Well, I can do it, but I, I hate I hate to tell you, but unfortunately it's not going to be admissible in court if he has even halfway decent lawyer because of the fact that that it wasn't done under a very, very, very specific pretense and a very, very specific steps. So by way of a disclaimer, I want you all to understand very clearly, I want you to understand that I'm not law enforcement. I am not military. So everything I tell you is just a real world in the trenches, in the trenches way of doing it. So. Gun loving grandpa said, I need to learn more about watching around me. Don't we all, sir? Don't we all? So, you know, if you get a minute, reach out to me there. I know you you live, you know, a couple minutes away there and it's hard for you to get over, but I may end up doing some material in the near future on that situational awareness because it, it seems to be a big thing. Uh, it's a really big thing and I'm a passionate believer in it. All right. So what is an OSINT investigation? Again, I'm not going to bullet point y'all to death, but I, I have to lay the groundwork before we get into the content and actual demonstrations and stuff so that you'll understand what's going on, what to expect, and what questions you can and cannot ask me, uh, what I can and cannot answer. Okay. So open source investigation basically means that it's information that's openly available out on the internet, out on the te technological spaces but not necessarily bound by laws. So in other words, what I mean by that is, so say for example, you want to do a criminal background check on somebody. Okay, obviously there's laws around that, sorta, if you're a law enforcement officer or military, but if you're just Joe Citizen like you or I, you can pay one of the background websites and you can have somebody's criminal background pulled. You're not breaking the law at all. Uh, all that stuff is out there and it's open source. So it's not necessarily bound by laws. Now, the flip side to that is where we talk where we're going to be talking a little bit about non permissive environments. You need to be aware of the laws for every given situation that you're going to be in. Now, what I mean by that is the second bullet point, you know, you must be careful of how you use it and what permissions you have from the principal and the investigative commission. And what I mean by that is let's say that you are a, uh, an advanced agent who is trying to do work for, you know, a high profile client who's a movie star. OK, and that movie star says basically the same thing. Hey, I think my neighbors, you know, is drug trafficking. OK, I want you to, to try to pull some information on him. All right. Immediately red flag should go up. You absolutely can go out and do that research with openly open source available, readily available information out there. But then what are you going to do with it? OK, so that's your invest investigative commission. So what are you commissioned to do? Who are you commissioned by? And what are the, the guardrails to where you're going to end up accidentally, accidentally breaking some laws? This becomes even more relevant when you're in other countries or that are full blown non permissive environments. OK, so in the United States, we, we are blessed with the First Amendment and the, the freedom and openness and availability of information, contrary to what you are told. So now open source is for, for what we're going to be focusing on today. There's there's a hundred other ways that you can get information. But what we're going to focus on today is uh, open source information. that's only available on the Internet. So if it's not on the Internet, you're not going to find it. We're not going to be able to talk about it. I'm not going to be able to help you in those particular areas. If you've got a buddy that works at the DMV, for example, who can get into their computer system and pull exact records for a car or you know whatever on a driver's license number, great. That's not available on the Internet, but that's a source. Hmm. Now, OSINT is not a guaranteed reliable source. So in other words, everything we're going to talk about tonight, you need to take with a grain of salt and check, recheck, verify, and recheck again. So if I pull up some information on, say, Gun Loving Grandpa here, and it says that he, you know, that he's got an arrest record a half a mile long, and let's say Gun Loving Grandpa's name is Joe Smith. Well, guess what? There's probably a couple other Joe Smiths out there. And so you need to cross check and make sure from multiple different sources before you speak with absolute certainty to say, yes, that's Joe Smith and he has a criminal record. So, again, check and recheck from multiple different sources. Now, be the bad guy. Be the bad guy. Be the bad guy. OK, understand you need to. You need to understand when it comes to 
investigating from open source intelligence gathering, when it comes to conducting yourself in day-to-day situations, even if it's just standard being situational awareness, the bad guy is a predator. A predator thinks differently than you and I. And that mindset is going to affect the way that they stalk and operate. So, for example, walk outside your house, go to the street and turn around and look at your house. Be the bad guy in your mind and think about how would I break into my house? How would I do that? And then fix it. So when you're thinking about being the bad guy for doing open source intelligence investigations and and information gathering, you need to understand that the way they surf the Internet, the way that they peruse things or go about their business, particularly when they're doing the bad guy business, is not going to be the way that you necessarily do it. And we're going to talk about the dark web and we're going to talk about Tor and we're going to talk about VPN and we're going to talk about Bitcoin and and, cryptocurrencies and things like that. We're going to talk at a very high level about a bunch of different topics. But you need to understand that a true bad guy thinks like that. But I got a quick bullet point in there, but but does the sis- but the bat does the bad guy's sister think like that? So that'll come into play a little later on as we're looking through some of this stuff. So for example, just just quick teaser, you know, kind of a little bit of foreshadowing for you. If I'm researching Joe Smith again, okay, for his, for potential uh, methamphetamine manufacturing, you know, maintaining a dwelling for methamphetamine ma- manufacturing, okay, he's not going to post up pictures of himself cooking. He's just not. He's not going to post himself up with pictures of him buying the materials at the local Dollar General to be able to go home and cook. But what about his sister, you know, or his mother or his cousin or his his brother or his son? Can you go to their Facebook page? Can you go to their information, their LinkedIn page, their Tinder account and so on and so on? And maybe you know their Instagram and maybe catch a picture of Joe Smith doing something and then start working out from there in your investigation. So understand that you need to put yourself in the shoes of the bad guy and and think like them and think that they are going to be focusing on on identity obfuscation and they're going to be focusing on tricking you, the good guys, into not being able to catch them. But the people around them may not necessarily be thinking like that. All right. And finally, as the final bullet point on this one, and we'll move on, I'll quit harping, is any OSINT investigation is only as good as the time you put into it. So we're going to put about, you know, two hours into it tonight, maybe a little longer. I'm already 27 minutes in. I'm getting long winded before I even get into the good stuff. But a true OSINT investigation, for starters, you need to have the understanding of how to do everything. You need to have that knowledge and that skill set and all of that to understand. But beyond that, if I spend two hours researching somebody versus three days researching somebody, guess which one's going to have, which one's going to be better and have a more comprehensive picture of what that individual or what that use case or what that investigation needs to, needs to yield. You know, shocker, right? All right. So. As we speak through tonight, I want to to understand the the three case study types of investigations that I'm going to be focusing on and talking through and the reason they're relevant. We've already touched on those in in, in a little bit. So every bullet point I'm going to talk to you about, every demonstration I'm going to show you, everything we're going to talk through, I need you to have three pairs of glasses, metaphorically speaking, laying beside of you, three hats, three pairs of glasses. Okay, And I want you to, to, to filter everything I tell you, because, again, I'm not law enforcement. I want you to filter them through these glasses. And try to understand, try to think like, like how this would apply if you were in, wearing that hat or wearing those glasses. How could I apply that? How would it fit with my particular department, my particular client's SOPs, my particular military requirements, et cetera? All right. And those three lenses are just you and I, you know, just Joe user, Joe Internet guy who's not law enforcement, not military. You know, just say, for example, your daughter just came home with her new boyfriend and he looks shady shady and you as the the caring father want to do an OSINT investigation and try to figure out as much as you can about this chump before he gets out to involved with your son or daughter the second set of glasses or filter i want you to understand and look through is discrete advance work for a high profile principle that is being actively monitored by the media or other intrusive entity And what I mean by that is, let's say you're a close protection agent 
and you have a very high pro profile client that people are constantly watching, both just the paparazzi style as well as, as, well as potential, you know, state sponsored or uh, malicious intent individuals. Some of these people with high level skills that may be able to do IP tracing, they may be able to do some type of intrusive research or penetration testing, uh, or even be masters of social engineering and be able to truly cause harm to your client if if they in fact identify a vulnerable point or a thread that they can grab a hold of and pick and pull. Um, those types of things may not necessarily even have the requirement of purview of law. You may be able to just, you know, go right into doing research and protect your client. And the last pair of glasses I want you to wear is law enforcement. So view some of the things I'm talking to you about of, well, you know, I can't actually do that because it wouldn't be admissible in court and it would break my chain of custody documentation. That evidence would then be tainted. I probably can't do that as a Leo or military, but I certainly can as a dad when my daughter comes home with that chump. Okay. Now, what the course or what we're going to talk about tonight is not, we are not going to go over full blown, you know, engagement for social engineering, penetration testing, vulnerability research or vulnerability assessment or any kind of technology re security research. Now, obviously we're gonna to touch on things uh, just by extension, like social engineering and, and you know, uh, things like that, uh, security research. We're gonna to touch on topics like that. But the reason we're not gonna go into any of those in specific is OSINT is the beginning step for, it's like step number one, you know, footprinting or mapping out your target before you do any kind of, whether it's, you know, you're a uh, post protection or executive protection agent and you're doing your advanced work or whether you're just a standard hacker or cracker or, you know, somebody like that who's actually wanting to do malicious intent and try to steal credit card information. You know, OSINT is the first step for either one of those, but we're going to be wearing the lens of the advanced uh, security professional uh, the 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 uh, executive protection security professional who's doing advanced work as opposed to the computer hackers. OK. All right. So let's jump into the good meat of it. So we've already talked about the first bullet point. The gold investigation is not going to be, you know, uh, 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 well, we've talked about it, but I want to reiterate the fact that you need to know ahead of time how you're going to be spinning this thing. So if you're going to be doing an OSINT, inv OSINT investigation, are you going to be doing it for pen testing? Are you going to be doing it at, for advanced work for, you know, a, a venue that your high profile client is going to be at in the foreseeable future? You know, certain hotels, certain stadiums, certain venues. Are you doing your advanced work ahead of time for it? Or are you doing a full blown criminal investigation or an investigation of some kind for somebody who's, who's actually, um, may have, may have, you know, complete and utter legal ramifications. All right. So before you even start, you need to understand what that intent is going to be. Thank you. C Freeman 21. I appreciate that the vote of confidence and the info. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you need to understand what the investigation is going to be about because it's going to affect everything that we talk about from this point forward. It's going to, it's going to affect which operating system you need to use. It's going to affect whether you use virtual machines, whether you use Tor, whether you use VPN. It's going to affect whether you can or cannot use individual tools. It's going to affect whether you're physically in person for something or whether you're pulling camera information. It's going to affect everything from this point forward, and you're going to need to act accordingly. So you need to understand and clearly, clearly outline the goals of the investigation that you're going to be conducting. So let's talk about the operating system. So, for example, if the goal of your operating, if the goal of your investigation is going to be to do the absolute most ninja stealth Viking investigation that you possibly can because you're in a non-permissive environment and you you're in a non-permissive environment or you have malicious or state sponsored actors who could potentially be involved or high level hackers who actually may be able to pull your data and your information and use it for malicious intent. And you are not going to want to use a Windows machine, just period. Not at all. None. Zip. Zero. Zilch. Nada. None. Forget it. I mean, now I, I say that with a caveat. Obviously, there, there are ways you can use Windows for OSINT investigation, but only certain things within OSINT investigation. And even then, you need to do it within a very clearly defined um, sandboxes to make sure that you're protecting yourself and you're protecting your, your client. Okay. 
you're going to need to use Linux or maybe an Apple OS X, which Apple OS X is Unix based and it, it's been pretty footprinted by now too. So even that's actually kind of, kind of sketchy to be perfectly honest with you, but, and you're going to want, you're either going to want to use a full blown Linux, you know, install like a, uh, you know, a computer that has Linux fully installed on it, or you're going to want to use a, a virtual machine. Uh, and we're going to, we're going to do some demos using a virtual machine and an instance of the Buscador, um, uh, uh, Linux operating system just for some of the demos we're going to do here in just a few minutes. But again, you got to know your target. You got to know what you want to do. You got to know what the, the goal of it is. You're going to have to do this outside of the, the purview of this training here to get the information about, you know, how to do virtual machines, how to do Linux, how to do, you know, uh, pen testing, that kind of thing. All that's going to have, you're going to have to go out and learn that on your own. I can't go through all that tonight, but I'm just kind of giving you some of the knowledge and tools that you're going to need to, you know, so you know what to go out and learn to get you on the right direction. Okay. So we will be running a virtual machine tonight. There's also live run operating system thumb drives uh, possibility. So for example, we're going to talk through uh, the, the operating system tails here in a little while uh, for when you're in a non-permissive environment. So there, there are times when say, for example, you're in a, a country that has um, completely controlled uh, media, completely controlled government sponsored network, uh, internet connectivity, but you've got to get some encrypted information. Even if it's just something simple like an email saying, Hey, I've landed clients safe. We're good. But at the airport you land, they strip you of your tech, your computers, they strip you of your cell phone, they strip you of those kinds of things. You're in a non-permissive environment. Well, if you've got a thumb drive somewhere hidden on your body and you've got say the tails OS, and you can find a computer anywhere, and I mean anywhere, that's connected to the internet. We're going to talk through some scenarios of how you can use that thumb drive to be able to get out communications out and data out of those non-permissive environments back out to the real world. In addition, everything we talk about today, you know, you can set that up as a live run operating system thumb drive. So in other words, like if you decide to go with... Um, uh, say Buscador Linux, and then, and you've got it, or uh, that's a bad example. Let's say you go with Kali Linux, and you you've got it as a live run operating system on the thumb drives with persistence set up on that thumb drive. Then you'll be able to install all these tools that we talked through, and all the tools that you know you're going to need, and you'll have them with you right there in your pocket, literally on just a little baby thumb drive that you can hide anywhere. I mean, it, just anywhere. Um, and again, so you need to know ahead of time, what's the purview of what I'm trying to do? What's the use case before I, before I uh, decide what operating system and what it's going to be installed on, whether it's a virtual machine, a physical actual appliance or machine or a live run operating system inside of a thumb drive. Okay. Open source software. Let me take a swallow of water here. Open source software. I'm a huge, huge fan of open source software for multiple reasons. Number one, because I'm cheap and I want to, I want stuff that's either free or that's, uh, that's, um, that's going to, that's going to be out, uh, not paid for. But the flip side to that is anytime you have a licensed product that can be tracked. So for example, let's say that I, I was using an instance of Microsoft office to create a, a document that metadata, Metadata is the data about the data. So in other words, if you've got a data file, a doc docx file, a doc document file, there's data about that data. There's data that says it was created by Toby on such and such day with Microsoft Office, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Licensed software can actually be tracked and can, can footprint the individual that you're investigating. So that tells you immediately, hey, this guy's got a, a subscription to Office 365 or uses Microsoft Office. It can tell you immediately he's using, you know, the Adobe suite of products to do his video editing. It can tell you things. So open source software versus licensed software, for starters, free is free. But in addition to that, licenses is that can actually be something to you that you can use to footprint or fingerprint an individual. Customized web browsers. So add-ins for the wins, add-ins for the wins. I'm getting ready to show you. I'm going to drop out of the PowerPoint and do a couple of demos real quick and talk through some of it so that we can quit PowerPoint you to death. Uh, but the browser you use and or the add-ins in the browser are significantly important. Just using a, an out-of-the-box, you know, uh, Firefox out of the box Chrome or out of the box, you know, Microsoft Edge or so on and so forth isn't necessarily going to get it done. Again, according to what you're doing. 
You know, if you're not worried about hiding, no problem. But if you're worried about, you know, identity obfuscation in any way, shape, form or fashion, you can't just use any old browser. Keeping a, a running list of hyperlinks. So I'll kind of glan let you glance at some of the hyperlinks I've got and understand that everything we're going to talk through tonight, a lot of these uh, hyperlinks get updated and are forever evolving. So a website you can go to today to be able to do a, a background search on somebody may not be there tomorrow. It may disappear or it may have a different hyperlink. You know, it may move. Key pass. We are definitely going to look at key pass here in just a second. Key pass is a big deal. So key pass is a password repository uh, database. It's a you only have to remember one password and that password gets you into all your other passwords. So we're going to talk through that and why that's important, because, again, if you're having you know fake you know, quick teaser, if you're having fake identities that you've created, that you're going out on Facebook and you're, you're doing open source information gathering on someone and you've got five different fake identities, how are you going to remember it all? And even if you do remember it, we're going to write it on a piece of paper where somebody can walk up and get it. No, you're going to use a, a key pass or a password database that generates a secure password that you don't even have to remember. All you have to remember is one password forever to get into the key pass database. And then it remembers everything for you. And we're going to talk through that. We're going to talk through Tor and Tor based browsers as well as, as add-ins. We're going to talk through OneNote. Cherry Tree, OneDrive, Google Drive, you know, all that kind of stuff. We're going to talk through that and how that uh, can be useful for uh, advanced agents or executive protection agents in doing their advanced work. We're going to talk about encryption and the, disk, the difference between whole disk versus file level encryption, safe file sharing and integrity verification. All right. So let's drop out of the PowerPoint and go ahead and talk through some of that instead of let's quit harping on stuff and let's actually jump right into some content. OK. So this is a virtual machine. Sun VirtualBox, by the way, has a, a free software. OK, Oracle makes it. It's VM VirtualBox, and it's a free software that you can actually use to do a virtual machine. A virtual machine means this is a virtual computer running inside of my computer. Um, so that's where we're at to begin with. And this one's going to be a Linux-based operating system. That's called Buscador. So Kali Linux is is the quintessential one that everybody uses. Buscador it was specifically designed for uh, open source intelligence gathering, for law enforcement, for um, executive protection agents, for uh, pen testing, vulnerability research, that kind of thing. So it's got a lot of good tools natively baked into it and built into it. And so I'm going to use it for the demo tonight since we're doing an OSINT investigation. Let me do something real quick. Let me get rid of this. Eh, we'll leave that. All right. OK, so let's talk through first off a real quick shout out to the OSINT framework dot com. OK, everything we're going to talk about tonight, almost everything, not the hard skills, because, again, there's a difference between hard skills and soft skills, whether it's firearms or whether it's actual, you know, this type of work. There's a difference between hard skills and soft skills. Hard skills would be learning how to manipulate a computer to be able to run a, a an operating system off of a thumb drive uh, or how to uh, install a key logger in such a way into a machine that it can't be uh, detected, how to increase the amount of RAM or, or pull, uh, you know, uh, pull RAM out and try to pull the data out of a hard drive, how to slave a hard drive successfully uh, without writing backwards and forwards data so that you're you know, corrupting the evidence you know, and making it non admissible for court. Those are the hard skills. The soft skills are being able to go to the different websites or the different softwares or the different computer programs that you're going to use for everything we're going to talk about tonight. And OSINTframework.com is maintained by somebody out there somewhere. And so, for example, if I'm wanting to do, you know, IP address tracking, okay, and then I'm wanting to do geolocation of, of where that, that IP address that the guy just sent me an email from comes from, then I can go to, to all these places. Or, you know, if I'm wanting to go to, let's say, for example, I've got, I'm wanting to do, I've got the guy's username that I have found uh, on a hash dump from one of those, you know, we're always hearing on the news where, where there's these breaches and vulnerabilities where, where they, these companies dump the information. And, oh my God, now there's a million usernames out there. Okay. Well, that's to, to, to the average Joe user that, that doesn't mean anything, but to the hacker community or to the, the, uh, penetration testing and vulnerability assessment community, that's gold. That then means I can run that through search other search engines and find other information. 
potential password dumps and then use those passwords to run to uh, uh, other sites. I could check your bank account from there. But at any rate, so username search engines, you know, to see, hey, you know, I found this username. His username is Joe Smith 01 at AOL. And then I can go try to do that. Point is the OSINT framework website. We're not going to go through this and talk through it at all. I'm not going to hit this uh, any for any demonstrations that we're going to be walking through tonight. You know, telephone numbers, reverse number lookups, and so on and so forth. Okay, but I just wanted you to be aware that you know don't don't try to write down necessarily every single hyperlink I tell you tonight, but write this one down. Write this one down for 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 sure. So thank you, Cyber Dragon. Appreciate that. Doing good info. Appreciate that. And gun loving grandpa said doing good. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it, guys. I'm I'm trying to give you all some useful information here. But at any rate, remember this hyperlink if you don't remember anything else, I'll tell you tonight. And again, remember though, each of these websites, somebody somewhere is maintaining these, they're gonna update. Okay. Sometimes these hyperlinks can be broken. You're gonna go all the way down this chain and, and it's not gonna be there when you get there. But write this one down if you don't write anything else down. All right. So we, we talked about VirtualBox and being able to run a virtual machine. Now, the virtual machine, I, you know, again, I'm not going to go into this. This is not a course about that. But real quick, you can see how in this particular virtual machine, I've got a Kali Linux and a Buscador instance in here. And I have the ability to make changes and roll back. So like I can also if it, I can also have a Windows operating system VirtualBox here. And if I think I've got a, 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 a bad email that's going to have a, a, a some type of virus in it or embed or, or crypto crypto. Um, crypto locker worm or something like that, I can actually detonate that, uh, detonate that virus inside of a virtual machine and then just nuke the virtual machine. But I'm not going to go too in depth. Again, that's another class for another day and another time. But I want you wanted to touch on that. We've touched on the Linux. Now I wanna, let's talk about Tails. So Tails Tails is I mentioned the live run thumb drive to use in non-permissive environments. Tails is a good one for you to use if you don't know, have the hard skills. Okay, so this is for complete noobs who don't have all the hard skills. So, for an example of a hard skill, every computer in the world that has a network connection of any kind, whether it's a wired connection or a Wi-Fi connection. Each of those connection points, so in other words, where the wire plugs into your computer or the wireless adapter when you turn the Wi-Fi antenna on, has what's called a MAC address. So that MAC address is, it, it, it completely fingerprints you just like a fingerprint and says, hey, this is Toby's computer, it's this computer, it's this equipment, it's got this operating system on it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's got this IP address, you know, uh, or then your, your, your internet provider like Spectrum or Time Warner Cable will assign you an IP address to that MAC address. But that MAC address clearly and plainly fingerprints you as the, the user. Well, when you're using Kali Linux or any of the other operating systems, you can obfuscate that MAC address. You can do what's called MAC address spoofing. You can say, hey, I don't want you to know that I am that I'm this MAC address. I want you to think I'm a different one instead. You can also do things like, for example, if you're running a, a live operating system off of a thumb drive, is you go into the computer and then as you exit the computer and leave it, you're going to leave behind tracks. You're going to leave behind little breadcrumb trails so that if, if by chance it's a really advanced system, they may lock you out or kick you out or may know you were there or may, they may, uh, you may leave traces and then they may be able to trace you back. So unless you know how to, to do those things, unless you know how to do MAC address spoofing, unless you know how to do, um, unless you know how to do, uh, you know, uh, uh, data protection on the way in and on the way out and to hide your tracks, a good operating system to use is Tails. It's the amnesia, amnesiac incognito live system. Tails. Okay. So again, I won't go into this. There's tons of YouTube videos and there's instructions on the website here for how to install it and how to create your own thumb drive. I'm not going to harp on that or go into it, but if you basically speak, and this is a good one for you to download and install on a thumb drive, set up your persistence and encryption. So as you're going through the setup, tell it, yes, I want to encrypt this thumb drive. So that nobody can get into the information with a 20, 25 character password with uppercase, lowercase numbers and symbols, et cetera, et cetera. 
and I want persistence. So in other words, I want you to be able to save some data because otherwise not only will this thing plug in and say, as you plug the thumb drive in and boot to it, not only will it say, Hey, I don't exist and I'm not here and I was never here, but it'll forget itself too. So if you unplug it and put it in your pocket, anything you, you pulled like data or an email that you composed or a document that you may have retrieved from that computer that you plugged it in, in that non-permissive environment and was able to retrieve data directly from that user's computer and then email it out because they wanted you to recover that data for them. Let's say they, that data was, you know, oh my God, I'm missing a file. Toby, could you help me? And you pulled that data within that non-permissive environment. It's going to, it's going to save that data for you in an encrypted format if you have persistence set up. But long story short, you'll be able to use that tails thumb drive. It will do all the automatic magic for you as you boot up and say, hey, Mac address is spoofed. You know, I'm going to clean up myself on the way in and on the way out. I'm going to give you the ability to surf, to surf tour and, and connect VPN if you want to. I'm going to give you the ability to encrypt data and encrypt send and so on and so forth. You don't have to even know most of the stuff. All you have to know is where the operating system is and go and watch some videos, YouTube videos on how to create it and how to use it and then apply that to your SOP or your use case like we talked about earlier, all right? So browser add-ins for ad block, tour, encrypted files, it's in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? You'll notice that this one in Buscador already comes with a ton of, of add-ins already in it, ad block add-ins, uh, uBlock, et cetera, it's Chrome, Spoofer, you know, HTTPS everywhere, which is a good one that upscales any website from HTTP to HTTPS and so on and so on and so on and so on. I, again, I'm not going to dive too deep into it. This is another one of those things where, you know, there's not enough time in, in the day. You know, it would take me weeks to train you on all this. But my point is anything you do in a web browser is fingerprinted somehow, it, even down to if you resize the web browser, if you make it full screen versus part screen, it is that is printing you somehow. OK, it's giving data about your just at a low level about what size monitor you're using, because if you resized it to full screen, that then sends that signal of, hey, my browser is this size. Please send me your graphics and your Web page in this size. Uh, and then, of course, ads. Ads are fingerprinting you constantly. We all know about that, how you, you're sitting there talking about, hey, I want to buy you know, a bottle of water. And then next time you pull up Amazon, boom, it's offering you sales from water. OK, so you need to research and make sure that your browsers are set up with all the necessary ad blocks and add ins. Now, the one we will talk about is Tor real quick. So I'm going to throw up. And uh, now this is now I'm back out of my virtual machine. I'm back into just my standard windows and I'm, I'm using the brave web browser. Now, brave web browser is. Um, test search. I want to tell you two things here and then we'll jump back into the virtual machine. Now, the brave web browser is a brave browser is a chromium based, which is Chrome based web browser, which means that all of your all of your. Um, all of your uh, Chrome extensions will work in, in Brave. Uh, and, and it has a bunch of, <clears throat> excuse me, yes. So Gun Loving Grandpa asks, will this work on cell phones too? If you're referring to Brave browser, the answer is yes, absolutely. If you're referring to virtual machines, you'd have to have a pretty beefy virtual machine, but there are definitely Tor browsers, Brave browser, uh, and uh, multiple different browsers out there. There used to be uh, Torfox and several browsers for your cell phone and for your uh, your iPads and so on and so forth that will give you the same type of protection. OK, so but where I was going with this is so natively Brave Browser has shields built into itself to where it's automatically stopping pretty much anything in the world. So you can see just since I installed this instance, it's it's blocked 344,811 ads and trackers. Trackers, trackers, trackers. Think about it. Uh, it's upgraded 5,152 instances from HTTP to HTTPS secure. And it saved me 4.8 hours. Yeah, I don't care about that. But the point is, natively, it's got this stuff built in. You have to turn it off. So, you, you know, Like if you've got a website that you go to on a regular basis, like uh, Facebook, for example, or YouTube, for example, then you've got to turn that off before it will actually, if, it, if you're getting an error on a site, you have to turn it off. My point is it, it's more natively protected for just day-to-day -day browsing inside of Windows than others. In addition, it has Tor built into it natively as well. You can do Windows, private Windows, 
or a window with Tor, and it will pop open a new instance of Tor where you're on the Tor network. And we're going to talk about Tor here in a little while and how, what that means and what you need to worry about. Okay. But I just wanted to mention Brave Browser. I wanted to mention all the browser, different browser add-ins that you need to research. And again, are you running it in Linux? Are you running it outside in Windows? And what are you doing with it? Okay. <clears throat> I want to talk through some of that. Now let's talk through if, if you happen to be a law enforcement officer. And you are doing a full-blown actual investigation. All right. If you're truly, truly investigating someone and everything that you do, every click of the mouse, every website you go to, uh, if you're on the dark web, if you're doing whatever you're doing, every single bit of it is admissible in court, then I suggest you buy Hunchley. Your office, your office will pay for it or you know, it's tax deductible or just whatever. But I suggest very strongly that you just buy Hunchly, period. Uh, and what Hunchly will do is it records literally everything, every mouse click, every instance. I mean, you can see from the graphic there, <clears throat> excuse me, how many pages reviews. It has full-blown reporting, deep dive reporting ability for the investigating officers or the investigating court, you know, district attorneys to be able to drill down in and see what you've done. It, it will record every video. It records everything so that there's no question or doubt you don't have to question the individual it's recording so i would strongly suggest that uh if you're if you're not a full-blown <clears throat> excuse me uh current law enforcement officer but you're wanting something that's close but free uh osirt o-s-i-r-t open source internet research tool does something very 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 similar but it's windows based only only windows okay and it's several years out of support. OK, so it's it's not going to be, you know, it's got Tor already built into it. It can download entire websites. It has video screen recording, automated logging, case notes, the ability to put case notes in uh, and attachments and stuff. It's got all the most of the stuff that Hunchly has. But again, it's old. It's Windows only. And it's it's out of support as, as I think it's out of support now. Let's look and see. Pretty sure it's out of support. You can email this guy though and find out, but pretty sure it's out of support. But it's free. So there you go. If it's free, it's for me. Uh, now let's talk real quick about KeyPass. So this is KeyPass XC that's natively built into uh, natively built into um, Buscador. But KeyPass itself, forget this one, go uh, the one if you're gonna be using Windows, the one I actually use 90% of the time is the actual KeyPass. And by the way, you'll notice another thing I was going to mention that I use DuckDuckGo for my search engine instead of um, bear with me. Oh, come on. Seriously. Bear with me. Bear with me. Got a lot of windows open. There we go. So you'll notice that by default, I have my default search engine set to DuckDuckGo. OK, DuckDuckGo and StartPage.com are two search engines that are that will help with identity obfuscation. OK, not StartPage, StartPage. We might get some porn pulling up there. I better be careful. Let's try that again. StartPage.com and DuckDuckGo both have the back end abilities to search Google, but you are not being indexed like you are with Google. So they search Google for you. In the front, start page actually has the ability to where you can actually even customize it to say things like, for example, um, do not filter my results. You know, I want to go through European servers at all times, even though it's a little slower. Um, uh, I want you to, you know, whatever. And then, like you see, there's an obfuscated URL that you can set as your home page. Like I could copy paste that and set that as my URL under my criteria. You know, I want to show. 20 results on the first page, always open them in the new results. You know, I want it to be Fahrenheit, you know, whatever geographical map show them. I want instant answers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I want it to be dark instead of white, you know, I want to whatever. And then you can save and set that as your default search engine or default search page. And you still have the power of Google behind it, but your identity is obfuscated. Same thing with DuckDuckGo. So I use DuckDuckGo and, and start page interchangeably. And uh, I very rarely use Google unless I absolutely have to. Uh, now, as you can see, the results are nowhere near as pretty or as efficient as Google. Uh, 
So you got to bear that. You got, you know, it's a trade off. You got to take it with a grain of salt. Okay. But anyways, back to key pass real quick. So key pass, the, the main one, the original key pass, the one is this one. Key pass, safe word pass, password safe. Okay. It is the very first one that was created. It is open source. It is free. It has a user community that is constantly making add-ins and additions uh, and helpful uh, scripts and, and doodads and how-dos for it. Uh, it is great. So it saves. A database, a KDBX, KeyPass Database X, that can be opened by any of the other softwares like KeyPass X, for example, XC, for example, including mini KeyPass and KeyPad, KeyPass X on your cell phone, on your mobile device, uh, with fingerprint recognition and so on, with biometric recognition. So you can actually create a key pass database, a password database, save it on your OneDrive or your Google Drive or your Dropbox or whatever with a super, super hard password and share that to every single device you have. And you never have to remember another password ever, just ever. You just have to remember one. And it's going to be more secure than even the one. So this one, for example, I have a password for the password. So hang on a second. I have to right click. And copy password to paste in the password to be able to even do this password. All right. There we go. All right. So uh, I have a few uh, fake identities that are not super secret built up for this particular demonstration. Uh, these aren't some super secret one. So I'm not worried about you knowing who Wayne Tester is. So don't panic the fact that you've got this. But see, I opened up a database now real quick. And again, I'm not going to do a class on this. You know, we, we'll that's a, n n for another time. Right. So let's say your Facebook main. Main account. OK. And my username is the dude. Because it really pulls the, the room together. Uh, so I can either type in the password. Really pulls the room together. One, two, three. Or, uh, or I can do that. Or I can actually have it. I can have it. Um, and I'm used to working with KeyPass more than I am with this one. By the way, just so you know, you can actually go in and tell it, hey, you know what? Generate one for me. I want it to be. And this is what I usually suggest you do 25. I want it to have uppercase, lowercase numbers and, you know, some characters. All right. So exclude lookalike characters, pick characters, whatever. generate it for me. All right. Let's copy that and apply. And you see it, it generated that for me. OK, so I can't crack that. Most most people can't. I mean, that's that's pretty solid. Even computer hackers can't can't crack that one. That one is solid. Um, solid, solid. Um, so. Welcome, C. Freeman. Hopefully, you'll, I'll be able to share something with you. This is a little bit in the uh, computer industry security realm of OSINT, but it's more focused towards uh, advanced work and the security executive protection professionals, but still some useful information. Hopefully, you'll be able to glean from it. Welcome. All right. So, at any rate, so let's pretend I'm going to save that one. So, I'm happy with that. All right. The URL is www.facebook.com. Okay. And I saved it. All right. So, Facebook, the dude. So you can see now I can copy, the, I can go to the, to the URL directly, right? And then I can copy the username and paste it in place. And then I can copy the password and paste it in place. Okay. Now that only stays on your, your, your clipboard for however many seconds that you have set it up to stay in there. I think default is like 10 or 15 seconds, something like that. Then it securely overwrites the, the, the clipboard so that that information is gone. Not only is it gone, but it's gone and securely deleted gone. So I go over tails again and I don't want to harp through it, but I'm going over it in depth because I want you to know that that's a super, a super important tool to use to keep track of all the, the, all the stuff you're going to be doing from an investigation standpoint, because if you end up, um, oop, well, I didn't want to go back to PowerPoint presentation just yet. If you end up trying to create uh, different identities and um, 
if you're creating different identities and, and trying to keep track of all of them, it's, it's darn near impossible. So use this for your day to day life. And again, I would probably create, you know, uh, add a new for, you know, OSINT stuff, you know, or secret identities. You know, these are my secret ones, secret stuff, whatever. And then you, you can track them separately, you know, that kind of thing. Um, OK, so that's why I talked about key pass. So Tor browser. So. I showed you Brave and I showed you, you know, in in this particular operating system, Buscador, there's a Tor browser itself is actually built in uh, as well as Chrome Incognito, which, again, is a Chromium based browser, Cycle Doctor and then Firefox with a bunch of really good add ins. But if you're out there and you want to, you know, you download the Brave browser yourself directly or. You can go to. Download. Oh, come on, choose them. OK, you can go and download Tor Browser and Tor Browser itself, you know, is cross platform. You can download it on anything, including Android, like we talked about, uh, Grandpa, Gun Loving Grandpa. Uh, to answer your question, you know, Tor Browser is available for Android uh, and OS X both. Uh, so regardless of which cell phone you've got, it's going to be covered. This will get you on to Tor now. We're going to talk more when we get into identity obfuscation about what Tor is and what the dark web is and what the differences are. So I'm not going to get ahead of myself. We did demonstration of Brave Browser. Now, real quick, I want to jump back out to I want to show you Cherry Tree and I want to show you uh, OneNote. So this is Microsoft OneNote. And again, I'm back out into my main Windows machine. This is not. There we go. Let's see if we can shake it all down. Shake it off. All right. So we're back out into the Windows machine. And you can see here that this is the native OneNote that's built in. OneNote is a, is a tool. And again, I'm not going to go too into depth, too in depth into it. It's, an, it's a tool that you can take notes on for your investigation. And you can do, you know, you can do things like, you know, highlight, you know, you can draw, you can insert pictures, you know, you can insert uh, hyperlinks to videos. You can actually record audio directly. You can take meeting notes and details. You can record video directly from into directly embedded into your notes. Something extremely scary about OneNote, you can take a picture of something with words and embed that picture in OneNote and it will show up or I'm sorry, it will be indexed and searchable when you search. You know, when you hit control F or try to find something or if you hit search over here and try to find something, it will search inside of your picture. So if I took a picture of a sign that said uh, no guns allowed here or, you know, we're closed on Mondays through Tuesdays or whatever the case may be at Joe's restaurant, then that image is going to be literally searchable. So the reason I'm pointing out one note, though, is more about this is something that you can connect up to OneDrive. And if that you're if you're not concerned if this say, say, for example, your your particular client and your particular executive protection agency has very specific SOPs for your advanced work, for the way the car needs to be set up or, you know, the way that you're going to set up your med bags or a checklist when you very first arrive at the venue or whatever the case may be. You can list these SOPs, you know, out in pages and divide them up sync them up to, to OneDrive, share them out with the rest of the people on your team and all of you are working live collaboratively and in real time. And you can even see who screwed stuff up. So you can go and see who, who the authors are. So authors will show up. Okay. You can hide or unhide authors and say, Oh, Toby messed it up. He's the one that deleted that page. Shame on him. He's the one that didn't get that particular project done. So, but now bear in mind though, this being saved out into the Microsoft cloud. So that, that does give you that level of potential for, um, potential for somebody breaching and getting that information uh, when you don't want them to. So OneNote is a great tool. It's an amazing tool. And again, I'm not going to go too in-depth into it. If you want to, there's tons of YouTube videos out there. There's full-blown training courses on it. But it's a good tool for compiling the notes for your OSINT investigation, for compiling your notes intra-team and with one another for advanced work and that kind of thing. Okay. Now I want to show you Cherry Tree. So we'll go back to our Linux instance. Cherry Tree is an open source version, very similar to it. All right. So Cherry Tree, just like with OneNote, you can add, you know, test page, whatever, and same thing. You can embed objects, you can embed, uh, you can embed pictures, you can take notes, 
you know, whatever you can do the same thing. You can share it. You could share it via OneDrive, Google Drive as a pure file, but you can't work collaboratively in real time with it. Uh, that's something you'd have to, to open up, edit, save it, and then get the heck back out of it. So, for example, uh, let's see if I got the right one. Nope, not that one. Uh, let's see that one. All right, there we go. So, for example, the Executive Protection Specialist Handbook that costs like 40 bucks, right? Uh, that gives you an exact step-by-step -step of how to do an advance, how to set up your first aid, how to set up your, um, how to set up your, uh, how to do your risk assessments, how to do your route surveys, how to do your pre-advance, how to do travel contact, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, building surveys, restaurant surveys, so on and so forth. I bought the book, so I did pay for it. So whoever the author is out there, don't get too mad at me. Hmm. I've got a copy of it, but I don't want to write in it. So what I did is I copied out every single page. So say, for example, let's say that the, our, our, my particular agency and my particular client has a specific SOP for vehicle setup, vehicle equipment setup, I can set this up as a tab and say advance, you know, uh, zero one for, you know, uh, California trip three to the Marriott, you know, and then I can have a sign, you know, I can delete out or, or add in the pages as I, as, as is needed by my agents and assign them out and make sure that they're getting done. And again, this can be done in OneNote or Cherry Tree. I'm just doing it in Cherry Tree because that's where we're at right now. And again, add to take away from based on your particular agency's SOPs, including full blown OSINT work. So, for example, I can do full OSINT workups in Cherry Tree or uh, in Cherry Tree or in OneNote or whatever. So, let's say, for example, I'm wanting to do uh, gaming aliases. So, like, so like we've got a Cyber Dragon in here. Uh, where are you at, Cyber Dragon? Cyber Dragon. There we go. So if I wanted to look and use, say, Montego and do a full blown footprint of his username and map out and sketch out every single system in the, un the Internet universe where his ID and that username exists or has ever even been thought of being used. I can do so. And then you'd put it, all that information here. You'd map him out like, OK, so this was his Xbox gaming ID and it did this and it was used over here on this date and it, it accessed this this uh, this virtual chat room with so and so. And by the way, we're not going to do a demo with Multigo. Multigo is an extremely powerful tool for footprinting and uh, and for, um, you know, uh, security research. But that is definitely a class for another time uh, because that one is about you know weeks long to do that. But the point is, from an OSINT investigation, I can sit there and gather all this information. I can say, hey, this was the information I pulled from a media scan. You know, this was the Google Maps and data information of where uh, he's he's been seen. This is images of what the backs of the buildings look like. Uh, that's a particularly useful when you're talking about doing like social engineering, like, hey, I took a, a picture of this hotel that we're going to uh, and I saw that the dumpsters out back were a company called Waste Management uh, LLC. Uh, and then I got a janitor guy who's coming up next to my uh, vehicle. So I've got the vehicle prepped and staged out next to the dumpster. And the guy's like, hey, man, you're going to have to move that, you know, but he's not dressed in a waste management uniform. But I knew that ahead of time that waste management was the company because I had done my, my maps and my imaging and I had done my advanced work 101 like I was supposed to. I'd know, dude, dude's not right. He's below the baseline. This guy's not baseline. Something, something's amiss. Something's wrong. Uh, Point, though, back to, to circle back to Cherry Tree in one note so I don't squirrel off too far is these are just basically outline tools that you can use to share, collaborate and and compile all of the, your OSINT investigation information uh, and, and like I said, share and work with your team. OK. <clears throat> no, don't do that. Where's my PowerPoint at? So let's go back to the see what my points are and what the next slide is. Bear with me. Again, this is the uh, disadvantage of doing this live and on the fly and off the rails and unscripted. So let's talk real quickly about encryption. So encryption on multiple different levels. Encryption from the level of the hard drive, hard 
uh, whole drive versus file level encryption. So we're going to talk about as we get into some of the hyperlinks a little later on, we're going to talk about how, OK, so let's say so let's start at the top. So I'll, I'll walk up to a computer. And I need to pull data off of that computer, put it onto my Tails Live run, run thumb drive and kick it out to my to my uh, commanding officer back in the United States. And I'm in a non permissive environment. All right. When I go to attach that thumb drive to. To that computer. And it's encrypted. There's going to be two types of encryptions. There's going to be file level encryption, which means that the hard drive itself is not encrypted totally, that individual files inside of the hard drive are encrypted or individual folders or whatever the case may be. Like that key pass database that we just talked through a few minutes ago, that file is encrypted. That one single file, that KDBX is, is uh KPTDX is encrypted. And until you put that password in with the correct software, it ain't going to open. Whole drive encryption means that every single sector, every bit, every byte, every inch of those platters or SSD is encrypted. So if I walked up with a Tails operating system and plugged it into those two different types of computers, if I plug it into a whole drive encrypted computer, I'm not going to be able to pull data off of that computer without having a decryption key. If I plug it into the same computer and the whole drive is not encrypted, but only file level encryption is employed, then I can pull those you know, files that are not encrypted, obviously, and throw them onto my thumb drive with persistence. Um, but I can also pull the ones that are encrypted, email them out or take them home with me. And then take the time to do what I've got to do to actually dig through those. You know, if I if I need to try to crack them for whatever reason or get into them, you know, I can do that. But you need to understand that there's two different types of encryption and you're going to deal with encryption. At, it's going to be a hiccup at every single turn, uh, including let's say you, you plug into like, let's say I'm in a non permissive environment. I've got to get data out um, or even in a permissive environment. Let's say I'm in a hotel uh, and I've jacked in through VPN. I'm a hotel in California. I've got some super important information my client wants me to email out because he's getting ready to go on stage and he don't have time, but he needs to get in from, you know, something back to say, hey, you know, change the PowerPoint for me when I go into the second half of the show or, you know, hey, uh, be sure to, to tweak this software setting because my guitar is not sounding right or whatever the case may be. And you've got to get that email out securely uh, and get that file out. Let's say he's got a file that he's pulled from his SoundStream software that he needs to get back to headquarters so they can make that and then get back to you. Well, you're jacked in with VPN, man. So that's awesome. So good on you because you're in a safe network, but then you send an unencrypted file and somebody intercepts that file using a man in the middle attack or uses some other, you know, actual physically being on site malicious intent, you know, top of uh, interception. And then they, they then have your unencrypted file in plain text or whatever and can do what they want to with it. So you need to understand that encryption is a thing at every single level. And again, according to your use case, according to what you're wanting to do with it, according to where you're going with that information will determine that how the encryption is going to affect you or how you are going to have to affect it. <clears throat> All right, let's jump back to the PowerPoint and go to the next slide. And boom. Tools of the OSINT. We talked through all that stuff. Let me take a swallow of water here. Well, how are we doing on time? So we've got 42 minutes, and I'll probably end up running long on this one just to let you know is what it's sounding like. Although we've only got like three, three more slides or so to go, but still. <clears throat> you can see I'm talking a lot, so there you go. All right. Identity obfuscation. When you're doing your OSINT investigation, sometimes, like, for example, when we're talking about researching your son's new girlfriend and you're going to do a full blown OSINT investigation on your son's new girlfriend and you do plan on doing that. It doesn't matter whether your identity is obfuscated or not, because I don't care, for example, as a father, whether that person knows I'm researching them or not. I have no cares. But let's say, again, you're going to a non-permissive environment or you have state state sponsored entities or actors involved or you're doing advanced work that could potentially be intercepted and used against you by the paparazzi or by other malicious intended actors. Uh, it could be uh, industrial espionage. You know, it could be something as plain and simple as old school, old fashioned industrial espionage where, you know, your competitor is constantly watching your client. 
to make to see if they can just glean anything they can to to negatively impact that bottom dollar and knock the stock down, you know, which could, which could ruin you. So you're again put those different glasses and those different hats on as to what level of identity obfuscation for yourself that you're going to need to employ. So we'll start at the very top actual physical level. We'll talk about uh, just burner credit cards and burner phones. You know, you see it in the movies all the time, but it's actually a thing. So if I wanted to go on to one of those, uh, say, background check websites and check somebody's background, but I didn't want you to know it was me, you know, Daddy Toby, Big Daddy Toby researching your girlfriend, you didn't want you to know it was me, then I'm going to have to obtain a burner credit card and or a burner phone in some way, shape, form, or fashion to be able to create those accounts and give it the, that multi-factor authentication. You know, we all know how you, like you log into Facebook and it says, got to have a phone number, bro, so we can send you a text. And then you got to identify that you are who you say you are. And then once you get in there, well, it's going to be $39.99 to get those uh, background check information. But I don't want you to know it was Toby. So I got to have a burner credit card. Well, bear in mind when you go to buy a burner credit card, those places have got cameras too. So if I walked into Wally World and just chunked up cash on the counter, cash is great. Cash is king. Bought me one of those prepaid visas for two fifty. You know, if somebody were running down the rabbit trail and pulled up those security cameras, they're going to see me throwing up cash on the counter and buying that two fifty prepaid visa. So you got to think at what level you need to obfuscate your identity. Now, obviously, there's cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, but I need you to understand that, yes, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin can be employed in ways. And again, we're not going to go into cryptocurrency or Bitcoin any at all. We're not even going to touch that subject. That is something you can go and research on your own. There's a ton of material out there. Uh, but understand that even with cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, there is still a fingerprint. It may not. You may be able to obfuscate your identity, and they may not not be able to get all the way down the rabbit trail to who you you are. But you certainly can footprint breadcrumb trail, or 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 check and see where those hashes, those encrypted hashes for cryptocurrencies have been used, how many times they've been used, how much money has passed in and out of them. So, for example, if you're those guys who are sitting there sending those phishing emails out and you're trying to scam people for money, I can pull up that hash if I can find that hash of that Bitcoin or cryptocurrency transaction. And I can see the dates that the transaction occurred, how much it occurred, what country it occurred in, sometimes IP addresses, although often those are you know, definitely obfuscated. But even Bitcoin and cryptocurrency can be in some ways footprinted and fingerprinted and breadcrumbed. Okay. Burner internet identities. We just talked about that a minute ago. So the one I showed you, the Wayne tester is, it's one of my test ones. You know, um, it, it's not me. It's not me trying to hide or, or be all secretive. But if I wanted to do a full blown identity um, and we're going to drop out again, drop out of the slide and we're going to go through some actual demos. So bear with me as we go through these. There are, you can you need to create a burner identity like, you know, I am Joe Smith. I am 20 years old instead of 40 something. I drive a, an Alfa Romeo, you know, instead of a, a, a crappy 2005 uh, or 1991 Silverado or whatever. Um, you need to have non-traceable phone numbers. That's not so easy. People think that it is, but we all know from the movies and everything we've seen, having a non-traceable phone number is a big deal. Obviously, you can go and buy burner phones. You can buy track phones, and that's that's a good way to do it. But there's also apps out there like Sudo, S-U-D-O, that you can go and buy, buy an account with them, and they can give you fake telephone numbers that you can use for multi-factor authentication, like creating an, uh, a, a, a fake identity Facebook account. You can use that non-traceable pseudo number to be able to get yourself an account. Uh, now that said, pseudo is a paid service, so it can be breadcrumbed back to you in one way or another. So we're going to go through a couple of those websites in a minute, so bear with it. Uh, metadata scrubbing. We're definitely going to do a, a demo of that here in a minute. Every picture you take, every piece of data you have, every, every, everything has data about that data. We, we touched on it earlier, metadata. If I make a document file, docx file in Microsoft Windows, it says Toby was the author with license number such and such from Microsoft on such and such date, you know, and you don't even see that data. It's data about the data within the data. It's metadata, metadata. That's a crazy word. 
At any rate, you can scrub that data out and obfuscate the data to where nobody can pull that data out of it. So in other words, I can take a picture, determine the data that's in it, scrub that data out and throw it away, then send the file. So again, putting us back into that, that non-permissive environment scenario, let's say I've, you know, Joe asked me to pull that secret data off of his competitor's computer, and then I'm, which is illegal, so don't do that. And then I've pulled the data. Uh, and then I don't want you to know, though, that it came from this computer or that that geo location or whatever. I can scrub that data and then you know, encrypt it and send it out. We touched on browser sizing earlier, so I won't harp that one. I won't give you a demo that can actually fingerprint you as to who you are. It's, I know it sounds weird. So can your typing, your language patterning. So in other words, the speed at which you type, the words you use, the general language you use. You know, we've all seen those forensics files move. TV shows where they do the, the, oh, you could tell he was, it was his T's and his O's because he always makes them this way and that way. Well, guess what? The way you type, the, the language you use, the speed at which you use that, that, the, that typing, everything about the way that you pattern your, your use on the internet is actually a, a is it numerically crunchable and is, is able to be uh, traced back to you as an individual human being. So if you're really wanting to get serious about, serious about obfuscation, there are websites you can go to. You can put a sentence in, hey, I want to say this, and it'll jumble it up and change it. Then you can paste it over. Um, so how deep are you wanting to go down the rabbit hole, basically? Again, with those three lenses on. So we're going to talk about VPN versus Tor and DNS leakage. So uh, we're also going to talk about the dark web. And we've already talked about Tails OS. So let's go ahead. Let's go ahead real quick before we drop out and do some demonstrations. Let's talk about the differences between VPN and Tor and what the dark web is and DNS leak. Okay. So VPN is a virtual private network. Almost everybody knows what that is nowadays if you work for a corporate environment or a, a company of any size that has that. Tor is the quote unquote onion like onions on my hamburger network that is a that is a, that uh, basically I'm sorry onion is dark web I'm getting ahead of myself Tor is a server bounce and a pooling of information okay so VPN is a tunnel that comes from your computer directly into your back end servers and it says I'm Toby this is a, an approved computer it has my VPN token on it, whatever that token may be, and the security decryption key at the other end. And it says, I'm that guy. I'm good to go. You can buy VPN, one of the most secure VPN companies out there. And there are multiple that have, you know, third, uh, uh, not third world countries, my apologies, but are in offshore countries and offshore accounts for VPN that will help obfuscate your identity and that have uh, rules in place where they will not release that information to government actors and government entities. But you know as well as I do that ultimately speaking, a VPN can be traced back to who you are as a person. Yeah, uh, even, you know, unless you are super skilled and you used a you know, burner credit card and burner identity and every single time you're doing MAC address spoofing and IP spoofing or proxy, you're coming out through a proxy before you get to that VPN. And then you're going over here and bouncing off three, three countries and then going and getting the VPN. Unless you're doing all of that due diligence and have that level of skill, VPN is very easy to trace back to who you are as a person. Now, whether the company releases what you're tunneling through that VPN tunnel or not, it's a different story, since theoretically, your content is encrypted and then it's encrypted inside of a VPN or a virtual private network tunnel. Okay. But that's an easy way to footprint back to who you are. Now Tor on the other hand uses pooled resources to pull information and spit it out. It's similar to file sharing or peer to peer network sharing or that kind of thing. What Tor network will do if you're using the Tor browser, like I showed you in Brave or the Tor browser itself, is it will go over to European servers, wherever you tell it to go, you know, how, how many jumps and hops and whatever. And it, it, so let's say, for example, I was pulling, I wanted to pull a Google search and I wanted to go to google.com, but I went through the Tor browser or I went through the Tor network it's going to come in from some other country, some other IP address, um, some other somewhere, send that information over that. And so Google then thinks it's coming from multiple people at one time instead of just one. And it bounces a couple of times before it comes back to you. So according to what you're researching and doing, particularly on the dark web, 
matters whether you use Tor or VPN. So in most cases, most cases, whether you're in Windows, whether you're in Linux, whether you're in OS X, whether you're on your cell phone, whether you're on the dark web or whether you're on the regular Internet, Tor browser is going to be your Tor browser or a Tor add in on your browser is going to be your best bet because it will give you that that basic identity obfuscation. Uh, it's basically obscurity through uh, or security through obscurity. There's so many people coming in that it can't tell who you are among the other ones where VPN can be traced back to you as a person. Now, DNS leakage is a website I'll show you here in a second where you can go and check and make sure that you truly are being uh, your IP address is being obfuscated. Uh, and by the way, IP address we touched on when we talked about MAC address. The IP address is what your uh, your uh, Internet provider gives you. So I think everybody at this point, most everybody knows what IP addresses are and how they relate to MAC addresses and how the two are different. If not, you know, after this this uh, webinar is over, if you want to go Google that, it'd be a good idea. So the dark web. <clears throat> so advertising agencies and the media do a great job of making that look just oh, evil and oh, it's it's scary. Don't go there. And, you know, we'll, if you'll pay us thirty dollars a month, we'll protect you from the dark web. We'll we'll scan the dark web and we'll let you know if you're being well. So there is an element of truth to that. There's always an element of truth in every myth that then carries over into reality uh, and then gets spun up and somebody somewhere tries to make a dollar off of it. Uh, the dark web basically is a, a, the onion network or a, a network set up underneath the standard Internet that is not indexed like the regular Internet is. So, for example, when you go to Google, you get 50,000 search hits on something because the whole Internet is constantly being crawled by uh, web crawlers and it is constantly being indexed and overseen and you know scrubbed for data so that you, somebody can sell you something to make money off of you. The dark web is not policed that way. And more importantly, it is much, much easier to stand up individual no nodes or endpoints or websites, take them down and bring them back up somewhere else, then take them down and bring them back up somewhere else. OK, so while the dark web itself is not evil and bad, like they talk about in in the, the TV shows and on your, your favorite episode of Chicago Police or whatever those TV shows are, it is a haven for those types of users who do choose to do nefarious activities. So when you're in the dark web, if you, if your OSINT investigation takes you for whatever reason into the dark web, say for example, you're doing, you know, again, your, your client is a, um, is a high level CEO for a company. He is interviewing a new executive level or C level employee that he wants to work uh, for him but he has heard some rumors via relatively reputable sources that this guy has been ordering um, drugs online from another country and having them shipped to himself. Uh, and some of the drugs are, are for actual health problems and some of them are for entertainment and potentially bad things. And you're going to have to go on the dark web and do a little, little digging around. You need to understand how you need to have a full blown. And again, we're not going to go fully in depth into that. That's, that's something you're going to have to either train on your own or contact me or whatever. You need to understand when to use VPN, when to use Tor, and when to just stay the hell away. Because there's going to be times and places you don't need to be. 8chan is a great example. If you are not the man, and I mean the man, it, it, it is also possible for you to get blowback or retribution from the people who are the man. When you get into, you know, when you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back and you need to understand that if you get in there and you're, you're challenging hackers or you're challenging those dark web entities, there is entirely the possible that they may step up to that challenge and come back at you. In addition, obviously, if you're in an illegal website, like we just talked about with with the, that scenario of going to one of the places where you buy illegal drugs. Well, guess what? What if the government has found that website and now they're watching you because they found your trace back through your VPN because you use VPN instead of Tor when you should use Tor. Um, so you need to understand what the dark web is, where you can and can't go in it, where you should and should not go in it based on your use case and when to use VPN versus when to use Tor and when to just stay the hell away. We talked about Tails OS for that. So let's drop back out of the PowerPoint and do some demo work again. Let's do. Matter of fact, I think the rest of the whole class is going to be nothing but demos from this point. Let's just have some fun. Um, I always went to sleep.
my Buscador. So we're back into to Buscador Linux. This one. Cancel. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And we're going to go. In this case, we're going to do. First thing we're going to do is burner identity generation. <clears throat> so like I to told y'all. Um, you know, I have a couple identities that are burner identities that I don't care if you know they exist. But, you know, you can you can sit down and you can just make all these, you know, um, full blown stories of, hey, you know, I'm 20 some and I love skiing. And, you know, and then you can go out and find. You can go out and find all this stuff. And then you can develop these IDs or you can just go out there to like some fake identity generator thing. And you can tell it, look, I want to pretend I'm from Germany and I'm a female and, you know, generate me 18 to 29 because I'm trying to find, you know, online predators or, you know, hey, look, I'm trying to I'm trying to find to catch a predator or whatever, you know. So uh, and then, boom, look, there you go. You know, this is your name. Um, or wait, let's generate first. Der. So there's your name, there's your date of birth, there's where your, your occupation is, you know, address, this is where I'm from. Hey, here's my email address. And by the way, this email address will um, work temporarily. Okay, it's an external service link or whatever. I don't do that. I use um, Gorilla Mail or a few other things, and we'll go through that here in a little while for the fake email. So I wouldn't use their email. Uh, but here's a fake, it even generates your fake passwords. Again, the phone number is not going to be real. So if you're going somewhere, uh, that doesn't have multi-factor authentication where they're going to be kicking back and asking you for that authentication. It's fine. You can use the phone number um, and it's going to be country specific. So that's a German country specific phone number. Um, ID codes, cars. I mean, it gives you everything, how much you weigh, what your height is, you know. Uh, and again, notice it changed to kilograms because it's European instead of American. Uh, your, your marital status is a widow. I drive a Chevrolet Astra. It's a 2002. It's a piece of crap. And here's my vehicle serial number. By the way, I'm an Aries and and uh, uh, I'm a Catholic. That's my religion. So I mean, you can go, you can make this stuff up on your own and make a, a really, really, really good Facebook, you know, uh, burner identity, or you can just let the, the 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 machine do it for you. I mean, that's where they're at. You know, I mentioned earlier uh, burner phones, and I mentioned sudo. Oh, come on now. So sudo is a paid service, but it is one of those places where you can get a fake number. Uh, and again, it works on uh, it is Apple based. So you are going to have to have an Apple device. Uh, I don't know of one for Android. So if you find one, you know, maybe post it up in the comments for me later. I don't know about one for Android, but this is an Apple based one and it'll give you, you know, fake is exactly what it sounds like. It's a, a pseudo identity, a fake number, a fake phone number that actually legitimately works. Um, so that you can do multi-factor authentication when those things ask for phone numbers and stuff to say, hey, are you a real human being? Um, disposable email. We talked about that. So let's hit Gorilla Mail real quick. So Gorilla Mail is a good one to make. Um, <clears throat> ah, an email address that deletes itself after a few hours. So if you want to create, come on now. So I, let's say I want to create a burner identity in LinkedIn and Facebook and uh, Tinder. What in the world is going on here? Bear with me. I can't get to that website for some reason. Let's try. I'm going to spell it wrong. HTTP. Try HTTP. No, let's just do www. Dub, dub, dub. There we go. Seriously? Okay. Don't go for the win. All right. So just like it says, it's going to, it's going to delete, a, it's going to give you a fake email that deletes, <coughs> excuse me, that deletes after a, an amount of time, or you can go to a website like, um, See if I can get this one right. 20 minute mail, and it'll create a, an, a, an email for you, a temporary email that literally deletes in 20 minutes. 
I mean, it's literally exactly what it says, 20 minute. And, and it also gives you a recovery key ability to where you can create the mail and then you can do recovery keys. So like if you're creating, again, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, whatever, Tinder, you know, stutter dud, whatever kind of account you're creating. And then you need to be able to have uh, the ability to do a recovery key or multi-factor authentication. This stuff will do exactly what you think it'll do. I mean, it'll give you a temporary email that you can throw away after you're done. Because, you know, once your Facebook account's created, unless you're having to do password recovery or something like that, which you're not going to be doing on a burner account, because in, in those cases where you're trying to obfuscate your identity, you're going to create that burner account. You're going to use it for that particular investigation. Then it's gone. You're done. You're never going to go back to it anyway. So you're going to walk away like the cool scene in the movie where the thing's blowing up and the guy didn't turn around. You left that email to die. <clears throat> All right. So file encryption. So again, we talked about, uh, we talked about, we talked about the differences between file level versus whole drive encryption. So a, a really great open source tool that's been around for a hundred years is TrueCrypt, uh, And it's really, Interesting. That's not the case. I don't buy it. So TrueCrypt is a, a Oh, okay. Okay. Never mind. It's giving you a warning. I'm sorry. I misread that. I misread that. They're talking about BitLocker. So BitLocker is the native built-in tool uh, for whole drive encryption in Microsoft Windows. That's great. It's you know. BitLocker is an amazing whole drive encryption algorithm that's natively built into Windows. You can go down to the start menu and you can click, you know, and you can type in the word BitLocker and go ahead and launch BitLocker and then you can get right into it. And it's great. But you need to understand that the, the decryption key, Microsoft is keeping that for you. They're holding on to it for you in case, in case you ever need it back. So understand that somebody out there somewhere has your decryption key. Okay. TrueCrypt is is a software that's open source that you have the key you have both keys you have the encryption key and the decryption key you have both of them the lock and the key uh, and you can do file level or you can do whole whole drive level encryption uh, and you need to google again this outside the purview of this webinar you need to google how to use TrueCrypt. Uh, take another webinar take some classes whatever learn how to do that but another quick so quick and dirty though let's say you're in um a non-permissive environment. You don't have a computer set up really good. Really? Come on now. I don't know if I could spell right. You're in a non-permissive environment. You need to encrypt a file real quick. Cryptomator. Open source. No back doors, no registration. Okay. Or let's say you're wanting to do, um, where's my Firefox instance? Let's say you're just wanting to do it on the fly like that second. Encrypt the files, send it to your boss back in the United States. Like I said, that file for getting that guitar sound thing set up correctly. You got send.firefox.com. And it's literally what it sounds like. You can drag or drop a file up to one gigabyte in size into it. It will encrypt that file and send it to who, who you, you tell it to send to. Okay, again, just YouTube this and, and uh, figure out how to use it, and uh, you'll be good to go. Now, this is fun. I'm glad that happened right there. So, HTTPS everywhere, that's an add-in that's natively built in right here to that, to that browser. We talked about add-ons earlier. That one, if I were to go to a website that's HTTP and not HTTPS, which means secure, uh, hypertext transfer protocol, or hypertext transfer protocol secure. It will upgrade that to a secure website for me by pushing it through their servers. Uh, that add-on is actually great. And that just updated because I haven't updated this browser in a minute. But at any rate, so back to the encryption on the fly. So again, like uh, back to that scenario, I've pulled information to, to uh, Tails. Uh, I, mean, I got to encrypt it and send it home, but I don't have the software installed, which you should. Uh, then boom, I can do it on the fly right there. All right. So metadata scrubbing. Oh, let's get into some fun stuff. So we talked about how everything has metadata, data about the data. So these tools are built into, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Buscador and into Kali Linux natively. Uh, you know, some of them are cross-platform, some of them are not. And again, this is outside the purview of our class. You can research it yourself. But uh, just to give you an example, I'll run one of them. 
it's a metadata tool scrubber. So you can, you know, like this one right here, you can just pretty much just literally the, the mat, you can literally add a file. Um, and then you can <clears throat> check the data out on it. You can see it's dirty or whatever. You can check the data out on it and then you can, uh, you can clean it directly from there just real quick and dirty. If you just want to clean it, you can clean all the data out of it. But let's take, let's open that exact file and take a look at it so you can see what I just did. So I'm going to use the uh, PyExif tool GUI. And this is a GUI, which means there's also a backend terminal version of it that you could run uh, if you if you wanted to. Um, so we'll just pull in a file. So let's say, for example, um, this particular file I've, I've opened before the class and brought it in. So this particular file, uh, I'll open it and let you see what it looks like. Just so you can see it. So this particular file is a um, a problem I was having with um, steel cased Russian uh, cheap ammunition in a 308 Win Winchester and loaded into a uh, trying to load into an uh, DSP Armory uh, AR-10 uh, Titan rifle uh, and it didn't feed correctly. Uh, to be fair, it was uh, user error. It was not. It was user error and combination of the magazine. Magazine was a piece of crap. But let's say, for example, it's, oh, I'm I'm holding your I'm holding your your AR-10 and and steel cased ammo and bolt carrier group hostage. And here's a picture. If you don't give me twenty bucks, you ain't getting your rifle back tomorrow. I'm gonna throw it in the creek. Right. You know, uh, that's a very real scenario. Well, not bad, but, you know, your client could run into a scenario where you're being jacked up for money or whatever the case may be. So let's open that file and look at it. So. So what can we glean from that? Right. So and the, again, these are just open source tools that are available for free uh, to be able to do this stuff. So you can see that you know, we accessed it. The permissions types on it, that's nerd speak. But that basically means it has read, write, uh, execute, read, write, execute. Uh, on it, it was a JPEG file. Um, it's 2000 or 4032, 3024 image height. The make and model of the camera was a Google Pixel 3 XL. So all of a sudden, now I know that the guy who took this picture is a is a is an Android fan compared to uh, Apple fan. So I know that about this person already. I've just learned something about him. Um, Software that uses HDR plus. So is that a proprietary software, one with a license I could fingerprint them with, or is that just something built into Google Pixel? Uh, I don't know, but I'm just saying that's something to think about. Uh, shutter speed, exposure, brightness, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Flash didn't fire, sub-second timing, interoperability. Um, so there's a lot of information here. 27 memory. Oh, look at that. So he took the picture. Holy cow. On 12-28-2019 right there oh my goodness so he's holding my ar-10 hostage right there as of this date and time anyways he's holding my ar-10 hostage right there so you see how the metadata that's inside of a file can be used against you or for you i mean you can use it to actually help you uh, in your investigation when you're talking to or about someone or investigating someone. But more importantly, you need to understand that if you're going to obfuscate your identity, again, thinking like that bad guy, look at that. GPS again. Okay. If you're going to obfuscate your identity, again, to go back to thinking like a bad guy, then, you know, you got to be aware of these things. So ultimately speaking, what I would do is I would scrub this thing using whatever, make it anonymous, you know, just scrub it to where it's nothing but the raw picture itself. And that's it. And then I'd send it out. Okay. All right. And again, that's built in. Now, there are websites, by the way, as well. There are free uh, websites out there. And I, I might, if we have time, I might try to pull one of those up because we are definitely running up on time. Uh, um, Mike built a great system. Don't know who Mike is, but oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, sorry. The, Mike did build a great system. Uh, it is a great funnel system. It's the skills to profit system. It's, it is an amazing system. So I suggest anyone who's looking to get into marketing or trying to increase your business or increase your ability to make money, or you want to learn the business, that kind of thing, for the love of goodness, check out uh, uh, Brightlink Consulting and Mike Walker. Um, oh, Michael Basil. I don't know who that is. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Duh. Gotcha. My bad. Sorry. So. I'm squirreling off. It's, it's, it's been about two hours. So Y'all gonna have to bear with me or an hour and 49 minutes. All right. So 
Mm. Real quick touch on DNS, DNS, DNS leak tester. So we're going to talk about and do a demo of the dark web and everything here in just a minute. And I, but I wanted to make sure that you understand that um, that if you're in, let's let's go back to my Windows browser here real quick. Give me a second. Bear with me. Okay. So let's say that I'm wanting to make sure that I, my identity and my IP address is obfuscated. So one way I can do it, and you can do it a hundred different ways, but I'm just telling you to do this basically. <clears throat> is I can go to somewhere like DNS leak test and look, see, I'm not in Germany, but because of the fact that I'm coming in via the tour add in on my brave browser, it's, it thinks I'm in, in, in Germany and that my IP address is 31.220.2.100. So I know that right now at this moment in time, I'm okay. You know, I can, I can search and that's who they're going to think I am, even if it can bounce back around to me. Okay. And you can also go in and do some extended tests and there's a lot of other websites and tools to do this. That's just the quickest, dirtiest way that I've seen to do there. All right. So the dark web, we talked about that. So in order to access the dark web, you have to be using Tor, period. So if you're going to say, for example, an Onion website, a dot .onion at the end instead of dot .com, a standard browser won't even go there, period. It just, it, it won't resolve the page. It won't be able to pull the data. It just won't go there. It will be the request, the CINAC request from the website will be rejected and your Tor, your, unless you're using a Tor browser. Okay, so we're in Tor. So theoretically i'm in the dark web right now theoretically already right here live and on camera so let's go to just um real quick just a generic website in in the dark web and we'll go to the onion search engine.com so just like google or DuckDuckGo. Or any of the other ones, by the way, if you're using Tor browser, go ahead and get used to, to a capture at almost every freaking website you go to. Tor is, uh, provides anonymity and that's great. But then everywhere you're going wants to make sure that you're truly and actually a human being. Uh, bicycle, bicycle, bicycle. I want to ride my bicycle. I want to ride my bicycle. Sorry. Squirreling. Come on, seriously. Let's keep going. Okay. So onion land search engine. So this just like DuckDuckGo, this is an onion land search engine. Okay. So you can say, you know, illicit drugs. And it's going to give you its version of you know, an onions link, you know, uh, of places it has seen that particular response for. Again, now bear in mind that it's not indexed like Google. The dark web is not indexed like Google. So you're 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 going to have hits that make sense and hits that don't, right? Hits that are legit and hit, hits that don't. And notice notice that there, the hidden wiki, then the hidden wiki, then the hidden wiki, then the hidden wiki, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not going to keep going down the rabbit trail, but the hidden wiki is actually a, a good, a good website to go to that actually has um, a bunch of hyperlinks to a bunch of good sites, but it keeps moving. For obvious reasons. And then you can see here, you know, here's a bunch of onion links, right? Here's a tour, you know, a market tour, you know, where you can go and buy stuff, both good and bad. The, you know, a list of web web pages, uh, Bitcoin mixers, vendor shops, and, su and such. Marketplace financial services, commercial services, uh, drugs, like we just talked about, website hosting, blogs, in the dark web, forums, chains, emails, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So say, for example, I wanted to obfuscate my identity and I wanted to create a uh, some Swiss email accounts or anonymous email services uh, that only you can communicate with the others or whatever. You know, these are the kind of places I would go and I would go in using Tor, not VPN for this protect for, for this particular use case scenario. Now, we mentioned uh, we mentioned 8chan. That's a scary place. Very scary compared to it's like the 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 
hardcore 4chan on drugs and, and cocaine and everything else. Um, I, I would suggest VPN and Tor and, you know, probably using a burner identity and a burner credit card for Tor or for your VPN account and everything you possibly can. By the way, Tor VPN is actually a really good uh, VPN service, you know, not to do a commercial for them, but Tor browser, Tor VPN, so on and so forth. They actually do a great job. And by the way, you'll also notice a couple of things when you're in the dark, when you're in Tor and in the dark web or surfing via any kind of Tor or dark web, you're going to have longer load times and you're going to have more captures, mm, obviously, because you're bouncing off of a lot of different servers before you're landing where you're going to be. You're not just going straight through your local internet provider and then out. All right. So that's a little bit on the dark web. So let's jump to the demo page. Okay, so let's just do a quick, we've, we've talked about a whole lot of subjects and, and I know that I've scrolled quite a bit. You know what, let's give you a look and make sure that I'm still real. So I know that I've scrolled a lot and I've went off on a bunch of different tangents and I've talked about a bunch of the different uh, pieces that, that fit together to make uh, an OSINT investigation. Um, and hopefully I've you know, kept y'all along with me for some of this stuff and a lot of it's made sense. Uh, now I've, I've, I've shown you the tools. I've shown you kind of some of the methodology I've shown you some of the, and this, again, we're just scraping the iceberg. I mean, I could spend weeks on each individual thing of, you know, the hard skills or the soft skills. I could spend countless, countless, countless hours explaining these things to you and helping you to grow and be better, um, uh, executive protection agent. But so now let's bring it all together and see how some of the pieces fit and actually do like a quasi semi um, semi quick, quick, quick version of an investigation. And I know I'm up on time. It's nine o'clock. I'm four minutes till. So I'll burn through some of these hyperlinks and scenarios real quick. Um, and I'll keep going as long as you guys keep watching, just to be frank, because, you know, I enjoy this stuff anyways, but let's, let's bring it all together and make it kind of real world and let's make it, um, make it, I don't know how long I left that up there. Sorry about that guys. I'm trying to, trying to produce this all at the same time. Um, let's, let's bring it home. Let's make it real. All right. So let's go back. Go back to my Buscador instance. All right. So we got, and I, I'm going to, I'm still going to jump around quite a bit, but we're going to do, we're going to do like a real world thing. So all right, let's, let's start at the very top. All right. Uh, you know, Joe business owner, uh, you know, I got this guy applying for a job. You know, I think he's could think he could potentially be, uh, you know, sea level could potentially be using drugs. I don't know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We we'll use that same scenario and we'll kind of play through that one a little bit. Um, so let's, let's just start. So let's just run a straight up. Let's just run a straight up investigation on somebody. All right. So then, you know, all the websites like pipple.com, you know, um, you know, and by the way, some of these are paid services, some of them are free. Uh, and so some of them you're going to get good results on, some of them you're not. Um, oh, come on. Seriously. So here you would sign up and you would go in and search. I'm not going to do that. We're not going to do that. But you get the point. You'd use a burner account, you'd create a pipple account, you'd get it done. Let's go to Noam instead. So, and again, thanks for joining us, Howard Dragon. We'll go ahead and start with you. Now, it's gonna it's it's gonna be a little it's gonna be a little sketchy. You know, you, you're going to see it says it's searching 575. It's going to say that it, it's found. You know, um, it's going to say, "Hey, we found 20." 20 social networks, this website saying I found something on BuzzFeed and Flickr and Twitch and, and so on and so forth. Well, you know, uh, it's saying it's available on Twitch, um, but that it's not available on these, you know. So in other words, I found Cyber Dragon on Facebook. I found Cyber Dragon on eBlogger. I found him on Vimeo. I found it on Reddit, Quora, da, 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 da. Now, is it, is it the same Cyber Dragon that we're talking about or is it a different one? I mean, who knows? Um, Obviously, he, he could be something different on, on Twitch. It could be Cyber Dragon 123 instead of Cyber Dragon. Okay. So, 
this is one website you check and then you check you cross check pipple.com and you cross check say cubid bib um and then you by the way you'd spin off and go to each one of those websites so you go look for the cyber dragon on facebook you go look for the cyber dragon on twitch and you'd start spinning off pictures and contacts and friends and and activities and likes what type of movies does he like what types of tv shows does he like what types of uh what types of groups is he in what types of things does he constantly like and is interested in what types of things does he twit or tweeter about what types of things does he post up on tinder or stutter dud or you know what types of things here and there is is that CEO potential CEO trying to do? You know what what is he into? What kind of person is he? All right, so let's say that that's this new CEO to be's name is Carl Weathers, and we know that he lives in Alabama. You know, you know what? Let's expand it. Let's just say all states. All right. And then look, they found 50 results. Okay, well, we know our, our CEOs, he's about 53. And, and I know that at one point in time, he did live in uh, Alabama, right? So boom, there's an address. Oh, look, he, he had these previous addresses as well. So then I can start spinning off of those. I can start looking for, like, for example, I could go to uh, Alab you know, uh, Talladega, Alabama, uh, Circle, Circle PA, Talladega, Alabama, and look at their newspaper websites. I could look at their um their local court cases for that particular county and, and search for criminal records. I could look at that state's criminal records um, databases to see if there's any kind of criminal records or anything going on odd there. And again, I'm also still cross-referencing this with photographs, pulling geodata or uh, metadata off of photographs, cross-referencing it with, um, you know, their, their usernames and accounts, things like that, like we just talked about a minute ago. Well, we know he's not 88, so that's not him. And again, I would re-verify this, right? So this is just one website. He could be something different on the next one we go to. So, um, so then let's go to LinkedIn. All right, and Carl Weathers. Uh, Carl Weathers is the man. Predator was great. All right. Okay. Oh, sorry, I was searching for jobs. So I'm gonna have to log in with a burner ID and so I'm not gonna do that, but you get the general idea. So let's say I've logged into to LinkedIn with a burner ID or one that I don't care about, you know, because we're researching a potential CEO for a company. It doesn't matter whether he sees that we viewed his account or not, I don't care. Um, but let, regardless, let's say that, that we've logged in as him, we've searched for Carl Weathers, we've found him, we've then again pulled potential resumes, we've pulled potential information about him, we've pulled potential career opportunities and past history, we've pulled potential references that people have given him, we're able to pull you know, friends, groups, likes, interests and everything and spin off from those. We're then also able to, uh, we're also able to find out what companies he's worked for previously, then maybe go to those particular companies and we can, uh, go down the rabbit trail of going to those individual companies, seeing if they have staff or if they have um, pay, web pages you can go to to pull information about people who currently work or past work. We can pull HR contact information and give them phone calls and ask them uh, information about, hey, how was Carl as a previous employee? Those kinds of things. So there's any number of information that we can pull just directly from those. Well, let's say that, that we want to go, you know, up the family tree. Like we want to find out, we see that we get to his, you know, Facebook page and we see that he's not, you know, he's not posting up a lot of stuff, right? You know, he's really tight lipped. Okay. Well, we can always go to family tree or we can go to, you know, um, we can run, we can run around him. We can go to his left and then come in from the right. We can go to roots web or family tree or, uh, genie.com, genie.com or to ancestry.com or any of those websites and we can pull we can pull now some of these are going to be paid by the way so for example um roots web is not so i don't think i'm in the right place but this is one of those websites you got to dig into and find but like if i could find him in particular um i could find his family tree then i can go around again i can go and find other relatives i can go and find um uh, 
I can go and find, you know, his sisters, his brothers, uh, whether they're still alive, you know, his parents, and they can then go start, you know, uh, trolling through their um, LinkedIn pages, their Facebook pages uh, to find pictures and information, pull the metadata from those pictures or whatever. Again, it's how deep do you want to go down the rabbit trail and how much time and energy you're going to put into this investigation is what it boils down to. Um, and then sometimes you have to come in from the left. You know, he, he was tight lipped on his LinkedIn and his Facebook. He was super professional. So I went around, found his sister's website and saw a picture of him liquored up, you know, at Mardi Gras on top of a card, swinging his shirt around while, you know, he was kicking a fireball into a building, you know, oops, maybe we shouldn't fire, hire this guy. You know, I mean, that, that's kind of one of those things. So then again, you know, let's say he, he lists a business, you know, let's let's go off on that rabbit trail. You know, I had this business I started up and it was successful and so on and so forth. Well, guess what? The BBB.org, Bizipedia.com, um, you know, Netcraft, you know, or I'm sorry, BBB.com, Bizipedia.com, places like that, you know, California uh, Chamber of Commerce, those kinds of places. They're going to have information, guys. You know, I mean. They're going to have information and it's going to be you're going to be able to map. Like we talked about using, you know, Cherry Tree or OneNote, you're going to be able to start fleshing out those notes and fleshing out that investigation. Oh, thank goodness I ain't listed. How about that? Too early. But again, that's that whole, um, you know, multiple different sources, you know, we, but that's Bizipedia. And again, we start start researching that particular business, you know, and going down that rabbit trail, you know, how far do you want to get? Has there been complaints filed on them? You know, is, is it a regular occurrence? What was the complaints filed about? Was it customer service? Was it this? Was it that? You know, those kinds of things. Okay. Uh, if they have, if they have a website, you know, <clears throat> and you want to look at that website and go down that rabbit trail, you know, so for example, um, you know what? We'll just go to my website. Why not? So, boom, you know, you can go to my website, you know, just for example, if you were trying to go down the rabbit trail of me and you can, you can look at, you know, contact information, you know, you can find out, uh, you can immediately start walking down. If I had a staff list up here of who the staff was and people that we work, uh, work for us or whatever, you know, you can start pulling metadata from pictures. You could right click and save and pull metadata, you know, that kind of thing. Well, the same is going to apply to anybody you're investigating, right? I mean, they're, they're going to be, they're going to be, if they have a website or if they're a member of a website in any way, whether they're just listed as a staff or whatever the case may be, you're going to have that ability to footprint that, take that notes and work with it. Okay. And again, I'm, I'm poking through some of this stuff real quick because again, we're, we're after nine. And so, you know, as long as y'all sticking with me, I'm going to keep going, but <clears throat> I'd still don't want to keep y'all here all night. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, So, you know, let's say we found the website, right? So, and then we want to see, well, who owns that? Yeah, who owns it? Is it is it Toby? Does he own Minor Major Armory? Yes, no, maybe. Okay, well, so we can see, you know, where, where the name servers are located at, who actually owns it, you know, what date it was registered, you know, uh, Mark Monitor Incorporated is the one that registered it. That's his email and contact. That's his telephone number, so on and so forth. So let's say that said CEO, who's been surfing the dark web for illegal, illicit drugs, it claims that, oh yeah, well, I opened this company and it was, uh, it was alphabet.com. It was, you know, I'm, I'm the man who started Google. Well, you know, okay. You know, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe he obfuscated his identity and had a third party vendor and consultant, but you know, that's something you can go out and research and find out, you know, that stuff's out there. You can find out. Um, let's say that he sends you, to or from an email or an address. Sorry, to or he sends you something and you've got an IP address from him. Basically, is what it what it boils down to. <clears throat> I'm able to map out his servers, or I'm able to map out um, his email, or I'm able to map out a file he sent me, or I'm able to pull uh, IP addressing by pinging back to him or something. Um, you can search right here and find out where that IP location is potentially. You can search that website and find out information potentially, potentially, 
Maybe you can, maybe you can't. Let's say that you're wanting to send, you, let's say that that same guy, he's disappeared for a day or two and, and he's wanting to, you know, he, you think he's out on a bender. You know, you hired a C-level guy, you're paying him six figures a year. Your client says, listen, I think he's on a bender or whatever. I believe he's flown up to Canada to get some of those, those uh, um, good free healthcare system medications. Uh, and, uh, you know, we hadn't seen him in a couple of days. Um, I've been sending him emails and he's claim, you know, he's claiming he's not getting them. You know, I don't know. So Canary Tokens is, uh, is an interesting concept. And again, that's a separate course. I'm not going to go heavy in depth into it, but it's a way that you can put, you know, effectively a notification like uh, the canary concept is a concept that they would take a canary down into the mines. And when the canary died, you need to get the heck out of there because that meant that the oxygen levels were dropping in the mines and you were reaching uh, deadly carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide levels and you had to get the heck out. So it's, it's an early warning or a warning to let you know something's going wrong or something's going on. So again, I won't go he heavy in depth into this, but this is something that you can do. You can generate uh, a URL. Uh, you can attach an image. You know, um, Word documents and attachments generally don't work. You know, if you're you're trying to to send this e this guy an email or you're trying to you know get a ping back from him to say, hey, has he opened emails or not? He ain't gonna open a document. People are not that crazy. But what you can do though is you can do. Uh, either a, a unique email address and then obfuscate that email address, or you can do just a, a custom web image or a custom uh, custom web image is a great one because you can have an uh, you can embed a graphic inside the email that's hyperlinked out to somewhere else that shows the image or whatever or uh, so like of your company or of your boss's company, you know. And then when you send that email, as he opens that email, it's going to send you notification that hey it's been opened, you know, uh, it was opened by this person at this time or this location, this IP address, so on and so forth. Okay. So again, this is another course for another time, so to speak, but I just want to let you know that there's ways to do that. Okay. Let's say you're wanting to send an email as though you're somebody else. Now, this is a paid service, obviously, but, you know, it's exactly what it says. It's the most secure email. Are you going to send an email as though you are somebody else? It's going to come through your SMS or SMTP servers or their their SMTP servers, however you want it to come. And you're sending it as though you're somebody else. Again, paid service. Um, but a lot of people will recognize where that would come in handy is a lot of your savvy users are going to recognize if you had a gorilla, gorilla mail address or one of those disposable email addresses, they're going to uh, know that you're obfuscating your identity, right? So something like this, you can obfuscate your identity like a pro. Um, again, tax deduction if you're having to use it for business purposes for your client to protect them. Let's say that, OK, well, you know, same guy, you know, he, he claims to have a, a boat in the in the Caymans and four homes and you know, he's got one next to one of Bernie's three homes and so on and so forth. Well, you know what? Biggerpockets.com. You may be able to find that. You may be able to find how many homes he has and where they're at. You know, you have to log in with a, a burner account or a, you know, an obfuscated identity account, obviously. But you might actually be able to find out, you know what type of real estate this person owns and where it's listed and, and, you know, some of the values of it and, and the areas and that kind of thing. Oops. Bear with me. Okay. I'm scrolling through my notes over here so I can be sure to get this going for you. Okay. So let's say, all right. So again, back to the obvious stuff. So, you know, criminal background check, the, each individual state, is going to have a, a database, okay? So you can go to your state. So like, for example, if I wanna go uh, Alabama, um, criminal search. Each state is gonna have a database where they have, they're gonna have inmate search if they're currently incarcerated or have been recently released and haven't updated. They're also, each individual county and or state is gonna have, in all 50 states, is gonna have court dockets. So like you can say, um, Alabama County X uh, court dockets and listings, and you're gonna be able to search in the foreseeable future for 
court cases and, and people who are, are coming up. Um, no, I didn't want to come up. What's wrong right here? Did I type in the address wrong? Hmm, I must type in the address wrong. There's a national search that I thought was there. Huh, interesting. Okay, well, at any rate, so there are federal nas national searches for criminal criminal uh, inmate searches that you can you can Google. You can find those either start page, go Google, whatever. Again, according to how you're trying to obfuscate. Uh, obviously, a good one is. Uh, CASA for children. Did I get it right? Yeah. Well, maybe I didn't get it right. This is one of those websites that somewhere in it has a listing of every single website, every single state's website. Every single state's criminal background. Yeah, well, it's it. So it's in here somewhere. So they've changed their website. So my apologies on that. They've changed their their um, their URL to nationalcasagal.org. But basically somewhere in there, there is a, a place where you can search for every individual state's criminal background search so that it's for the protection of children. Obviously you can go to that particular state's criminal background check search engines and find. And of course the one that everybody knows about is the, the national sex offenders search registry. Now there's also apps on everybody's phone, uh, whether it's Android or Apple, uh, it doesn't matter. There's going to be apps that actually can you can geolocate where you are and find within X radius that you've defined of your lo current location of all the sex offenders that are in your area or near. But the point is, in this particular case, we'd be researching to say, OK, does, you know, Mardi Gras guy who's kicking the, the who's slinging his shirt around top of the car, you know, oops, is he a sex offender? And by the way, we've already found known addresses, known places from people or from, you know, um, real estate searches or whatever the case may be. So we already know basically where he would have been registered for sex offender. And is he okay? Uh, sorry, I keep clicking the links there. Let's just drop out of that. No, let's don't. You're right. Let's say you're, let's say that you're doing your advance work and that you're to the point where you're in your advance and you're doing seriously, you're doing some of your hotel and your, your scanning information for um, you're doing your advanced work for your, um, like your hotel survey, you're doing your building survey, restaurant survey, you know, those types of things, uh, public appearance surveys around the area, airport surveys, you're trying to do all that information and you're curious about what the, uh, what the criminal statistics in the area are, what the potential crime elements that you may have to deal with, uh, you know, is carjacking a thing, you know, uh, is, is, you know, drug, you know, crystal, uh, crystal meth a thing. What's the thing? So cityprotect.com is a great resource where you can actually go in uh, and explore crime maps and determine what the um, criminal data in that particular area is. Also, of course, there are the uh, national criminal, national crime and research institutes and those kinds of things that you can pull up as well. Okay. Obviously there is the, uh -huh. that one didn't work. There we go. Inmate Locators Bureau of Federal Prisons keeps an inmate locator at all times where they can, uh, you know, you can find by name or by number an inmate where they are since 1982 to the present. 
It's a good place to dig people up. Okay. Now this one, this one is hit or miss. This is, it's if you've got a friend in the law enforcement industry, obviously you being able to search for a, a lost or stolen firearm is going to be the better method. But this one's an open source database that's maintained by uh, uh, users. Uh, like if I, if my gun were stolen, I could report to them. So you can try it. Like if, you know, if a firearm is, uh, let's say you, you go to, you're going to a, um, um, another country and you, you don't know some of your contacts, you haven't had that professional experience with them. And you, you know, you've done your advanced work, you show up in country, uh, you, you, the hand you a firearm to use and you don't know if the thing's hot, if it's legit, if it works, you don't know nothing and you can't jump up and run to the range. Right. And you can't necessarily, you know, you don't know if they're trying to set you up to where you're taking a, a stolen firearm out and that they're going to conveniently pull you over for speeding, whether you are or not. Uh, maybe, maybe you'll get something a hit off of this. Maybe not. You might be better off to call a, a, a legit contact, but. It's exactly what it sounds like as a stolen gun database. Um, oops. This is an interesting website. Pimeyes.com. Now, again, some of this is going to be some of this is going to be paid services, okay, versus free services, but you can actually upload, you know, we all know that Google, Facebook, and all these other places have uh, facial recognition software and facial recognition that's going on. You might get lucky and be able to upload an image of somebody uh, if you don't know who that person is or what their name is, and you might be able to pull results for them. Now, be careful. This is another one of those where it's going to show you, oh, we found 5,000 results. Eh, maybe you did, maybe you didn't, you know, um, and there's going to be people who look similar to one another, but this is uh, the ability for you to reverse image search a picture and see if you can find out information on who the individual was. I know this is going to sound a little creepy. But if you're again, we talked about the family trees. We talked about profiling someone's entire entire family and, and finding out sisters, cousins, uncles, you know, so on and so forth. Findagrave.com does exactly what it sounds like. Oh yeah, you know, my name's Carl Weathers, wink wink, but it turns out Carl Weathers supposedly died last year. Well, you'd be shocked. At how many, it, well, it says it right there, over 180 million memorials created by the community since 1995. You'd be shocked. I was shocked when I started pulling up my family members of how many of them there's actually a photograph, literally, of the headstone uh, where these graves, gravesite collections are at. It's shocking. Um, voter records, right? So, Let's say, you know, obviously, you know, I would never say Democrat versus Democrat versus independent versus Republican. It's none of my business, what you are and what you do, but it may matter to your client. It may matter to where they're going. It may matter for the, the particular fundraising event they're going to. It may matter for their, their business's goodwill or their, their company's goodwill to say, hey, you know, he was funded by a bunch of the Green Party. And then suddenly, boom, you know, your company loses face and goodwill or whatever the case may be because of the voter registration or because of the way that the particular donors were voter registered. We talked about BBB.org and business lookups. Oh, here's a fun, fun one. Back to that. Hi. Oh, let's see if I can get it right. Who has he given money to? Who have they politically donated to? Who is politically donated to them? Vice versa. Obviously, for high profile clients, that's a thing. You know, if you're going to be interacting with somebody, you may want to be cautious about the, the damage it could be potentially caused to that, that uh, client's profile, uh, their goodwill. 
Um, and obviously this type of thing can be researched, easily researched, a lot of times, easily researched and show up on there. You know, he, he gave he gave money to, you know, there we go, Nancy Pelosi for a, a specific uh, bill that relates to, you know, an, an eco unfriendly uh, news article that's been hitting in the particular area. And so we may want to kind of back off from doing that. Uh, hand, sh- you know, that shaking babies and kissing hands session with that particular gentleman because it could be damaging to my client's uh, image or his goodwill, right? Um, there's all kinds of business lookups. I'm not going to go to all of them. You got glassdoor.com, bb.org, uh, dobsearch.com. Um, you've got opencorporates.com. Here's a fun one. So let's say you're wanting to find out information on the individual user's vehicle. Well, for a couple of bucks, you can. You know, your client or your 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 investigative recipient, if you a couple of bucks, you can find out everything about their vehicle, the history of it, you know, where it come from, where it's going, that kind of thing. But here's an even better one. Well, I wouldn't say better, but here's a better use case. Let's say, let's say, and this is the last one I'm going to go through, by the way. I think I'm going to call it after this. Let's say that I see a car, whether it be by, you know, uh, Google Maps, whether it be by direct investigation of an individual. Let's say that, it, you know, let's go back to the whole, uh, you know, I'm in a non-permissive environment. I see, you know, cars pulling up that looks suspect out front, you know, uh, things are looking a little weird, you know, to get a little sketchy, I'm getting a little nervous. You can go to O'Reilly's Auto Parts and you can enter the license plate and you can search for that VIN number or license plate and interestingly enough, as long as it's in within a reasonable amount of time and in the database, you're going to find out everything about that vehicle. So in this particular case, you're going to be able to find out, let's say, for example, that I needed to place a geo, uh, a geo locator on that vehicle for some reason. Then I'm going to be able to take that information, pull the, the vehicle manual somewhere online, and I'm going to be able to find out where I can place that geo locator without any kind of electromagnetic interference from other parts of the car, for example. Or, hey, I wanted to wire it in line inside of one of the quarter panels. And, OK, well, now I can pull a manual. I can figure out how to pop that panel off, you know, boom, done. Right. Um, let's say, for example, that God forbid I need to hotwire a vehicle. Well, this particular vehicle is actually super, super easy to hotwire. And I can jump right on YouTube, like, oh, oh my God, I'm trying to get away. My client, we've had a fire pop off. You know, there's been an active shooter in the, the venue that he was at. We've got it, we can't get to our our vehicles, our motorcade. Oh my God, we're out in the parking lot, but I've got to get this guy out of here. Uh, oh, look, there's a 91 Chevrolet K1500 YouTube real quick. Boom, boom, bing, bang, boom. Um, bing, uh, hot wire, get them out of there. Um, things like, you know, investigated, you know, has there been recalls on this particular vehicle? Do I want my, do I want my, do I want my client in that vehicle? You know, it's, it's synonymous or infamously known for having, uh, you know, airbag issues to where they deploy and break his neck or something like that. You know, there's any number of crazy amounts of information you can get just by pulling up literally the VIN number or the license tag number at a publicly available website. Um, I won't, you know, there's no end to the amount of information that can be done with this, you know, Hey, I need to, I need to, to, to fake like and make the car stop working or something like that for whatever reason and break down with the next amount of time. Okay. Well, does it take gas? Does it take, you know, diesel, you know, how, how am I going to do that? Naturally aspirated means that particular one's a carburetor versus a fuel injector. So then theoretically, if I clogged up, you know, if there was a clog in the carburetor that could cause it to have issues to where, Oh, look, it pulled over on the side of the road five miles from here, you know, that, that kind of thing. So I won't go into the, the myriads of hundreds of scenarios where this is useful, but obviously that type of thing in your OSIN investigation for, you know, advanced work or for your taking care of your client, super good stuff. So all that said, I'm going to shut up. So, I see that we still have four people who stuck with me through all this and I only went over by 28 minutes. So 
two and a half hours, me just sitting here chiming on and droning on about uh, useful information and open source inf information technology um, or technology for investigating. Uh, and you still hung with me. So let's see. Is that me? There we go. So I'm going to start sweeping the floors and locking the doors. I see that there's five of you still out there watching. If there are any questions, now would be the time to pop them into the chat and let me know. If you don't have any questions, and by the way, once again, please like, subscribe, ring the notification bell. Uh, let me know you're out there. You know, thumbs up, thumbs down. I don't care. Let me know you're out there. Um, go to mineridgearmory.com. Follow my content and my calendar there. <laughs> yeah, much love to you too, sir. Appreciate you being here. And by the way, we we did uh, we checked Cyber Dragon, but not Cyber Dragon 98 for username. Now I'm gonna have to go back and do that. Um, appreciate that, but. At any rate, um, thank you, Best Ego Detective Agency. I appreciate that. Um, I hope that this was truly actually helpful, particularly for PI and for EP. Again, I literally just barely, barely scratched the surface of this, man. I mean, I just, there is so much to know, so much to do, and hopefully what I did was a little bit helpful to you. So yes and no. So again, that would be the ones that would be uh, where we talked about about going to the family members and looking around from the left or from the right, like coming in from one side or the other. Uh, you're not going to be able to actually view. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say this with the caveat of be cautious how you use this information, right? So this is where social engineering comes in handy. So let's say for example you've got an individual who has a private uh, a, a media profile that's set to private on say Facebook. Okay. And you've done the investigation by going to his friends and his friends, friends and his sisters and his mama and all that stuff. And you've narrowed it down to where I think this is his user profile. This is the one that I think it is, uh, but I can't view it because it's private. Um, one way you can do that is, you know, again, you've researched over to the left and to the right and you've found out things that, that he likes, things he's interested in from other avenues. You know, maybe his Facebook page, maybe from LinkedIn, maybe from you know, Tinder, um, Stutter Dud. By the way, Stutter Dud's a great one. Uh, it's a paid service, but it's a great one to be able to find out uh, credit scores, home ownership, uh, a lot of financial information about a person. Um, but you found out these likes and interests. So then you could go and create one of those uh, profiles like we talked about earlier on in this video. You could generate a profile. Of say, you know, I mean, if let's say for example he's homosexual and he's into um, he's into um, surfing, then you could create a profile that that met his age criterion that you felt like he liked, uh, and then you know post up surfing pictures and so on and so forth. And there are websites out there that can uh, generate fake identity pictures. Um, if I get a second, I'll pull them up. But there's ones that will literally generate pictures of this person is not real. Let's see if I can do it. And then at any rate, there's a website out there. I'm going to see if I can find it. This person does not exist. Um, you can generate that, that you can generate that identity and then you can friend him from there. So this, this, is this, uh, Basically, it's a website that generates pictures of people who don't exist. It takes pictures out there on the Internet and mashes them up and does it uses an artificial intelligence algorithm to create fake pictures. And so you could just sit there and keep generating through pictures until you found one that met the uh, the profile, the fake profile that you had created. It met that need. Uh, and then again, go in, create that profile, go out and make your, your, you know, uh, go out and like a bunch of surfing websites or whatever the case may be, like a bunch of local bars that are maybe very high end. If it's, if he's a high end individual and he's actually high net worth or whatever, then go and try to friend him and try to try to, that's social engineering one-on-one. -on -one. Um, now, again, I say that with the disclaimer and the caveat that, that, you know, none of this needs to be used for negative or evil intent or malicious intent. Everything you do needs to be purely for the benefit and protection of your client. Uh, uh, so hopefully that helps uh, Vestigo Detective Agency. Hopefully that's some helpful information to get you your answer there. So any other questions?
That was a good one, by the way. I like that because then I had to think through the scenario of how I would, you know, one that's and that's just one of a dozen methodologies, right? Of ways that you could get in, get in the door with him. But that's all social engineering one on one. All right. So looks like I'm down to six viewers or went back up to six viewers. Hopefully, again, a bunch of this content was um, was helpful. Like, subscribe, go to my Facebook Mind Ridge Army page, follow me there. Keep an eye out for events and webinars with this COVID-19 thing that's going on. I plan on doing some more content over the next few weeks. Uh, that's hopefully no problem. That's Digo, Detective Agency. I, I really appreciate you being here and sticking with me through this two and a half hours of droning on. Uh, hopefully there was some beneficial information. Um, uh, anyways, like, subscribe, ring the bell, do all the good stuff. You all know the deals. Uh, contact me directly either by miningragearmory.com. Contact me with direct message through Facebook. Contact me uh, direct message through LinkedIn, however you want to get me. If there's any other questions you have, leave questions below. I will kind of periodically check back through this video and see if there's any information I can provide the answers to. I don't know everything. I don't even know one, one billion of everything, uh, but I know a lot of people who do. So, no, no, ask, will this be uploaded to use for late, later use? <sighs> I think so. So I'm looking back on everything I've talked about tonight. Nothing I've talked about tonight was um, was nothing, anything other than nothing proprietary as far as information goes. I didn't get so far down the rabbit hole that it, it, it uh, negated any of the training that I do from the side or would deter anybody from contacting me for, for, for training them to financially hurt my business. I don't think I shared any information about anyone or any individuals that would be harmful to them. Um, so I think I will leave it up on my YouTube channel. Um, I will kind of monitor it because obviously some of the stuff we talked about tonight, uh, again, while you can go out and get this training from anybody 101, maybe not specifically with a slant towards the executive protection or, uh, you know, advanced work, it's usually more towards the uh, penetration tester vulnerability assessment, um, side of the house. While you can go get this training from anybody out there, obviously this type of training can be used for malicious intent. It can be used for, you know, the bad guys can be using it, you know, for stalking. The bad guys can be using it for social engineering. Like I said, you know, business footprinting to be able to do um, any kind of number of bad things. So that's a great question. And I'm, I have struggled with that information inside of my head. Uh, as of right now, yes, I'm planning on leaving it on my YouTube channel. Again, I'm going to monitor um, how that goes. Uh, and then if it, if it looks like it's bad. Uh, what I will do is I will list it as private and I will reach out to anybody who attended tonight uh, and make sure that they have a link if they so desire. And if you see that it goes private or unlisted, reach out to me directly and I will see if I can get you um, a private link to this video to where you can continue to watch it. But as of right now, I plan on leaving it in public. Great question. And one I struggled with, by the way. I think I like my YouTube channel though, man. Like it, subscribe, thumbs up, thumbs down, follow, some, you know, whatever. Do that bell thing. Come on, at least do me some favor here. All right. Let's see if there's any more questions, I'll give it another another minute or two, and then I'm going to call it. You're welcome, Doe. <laughs> Thanks, Cyber. Appreciate it. Let's see how's that show up on screen? Just curious. Oh, it shows up in colons. Stream software I'm using. All right. Well, thank you all for attending this. I appreciate it very much. Hopefully this, this has been informational and informative for some of you. Um, again, if you need me, contact me. I'll quit rubbing it in the ground. Uh, until we see you out on the range. Oh, and by the way, side note, I also do reviews you'll see it from minoridgearmory.com so there's also uh, a company that i do gear reviews for that you can actually check out and and uh, follow them as well uh, and get some of my content when i do it over there but along those lines until we see you out on the range you keep living your dream <laughs>